Good morning. Welcome everybody to the Committee of the Whole meeting for the District of Squamish for March 23rd, 2021. I am Councillor Doug Race. I'm the Acting Mayor this month and will be chairing this meeting uh, with all Council is in attendance. Welcome Squam, Chris Collecta, Sos, Squamish, Awayanui. Welcome to the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. Uh, first, I'd like a motion to adopt the agenda. I don't anticipate any changes. Moved by Councillor Herford, second by Councillor Pettengill. Any opposed? Motion carries. Second is Ministerial Order M192, staff recommendation that pursuant to Ministerial Order number M192, the District of Squamish is excluding in-person public attendance at this March 23rd, 2021 meeting on the basis that full public attendance in a manner consistent with public health orders and recommendations cannot be accommodated at this time and the district is ensuring openness, transparency, accessibility, and accountability at this meeting by the following means. This meeting is being live streamed. A video of this meeting will be available on the district's website for viewing on an on-demand basis. Is there a mover of that motion? Moved by Councillor French, second by Councillor Stoner. Any opposed? Motion carries. So the first item of business today is the introduction of our new officer in charge. Uh, Inspector Robert Dykstra. And Inspector Dykstra, if you're there, you can open up your screen and say hello. Uh, hi there. Good morning. I'm having a difficult time with this WebEx, so hopefully uh, you can see me. Um, not yet. I'm assuming. No, not yet. Can no. you, you can hear me, though. I can hear you. All right. Let's see here. I apologize. There we go. <laughs> Hello. We have, you now. we have you now. So there are very. Um, yes. you... Go ahead. So I'll just, just give you the format. All members of council are here. I'm one of the yes. councilors. The mayor is actually in attendance as well, uh, and the whole of council, as well as some staff people. Uh, staff Sergeant Bradley from the Squamish Detachment, who you may have talked to or met before. And our CAO, Linda Glenn. Yes. And Dan Paisley, I think at the top there in this. Yep. Uh, and Gary Buxton, who is over here on my side. Uh, so, Inspector, it's nice to meet you. Um, and so, I guess uh, maybe to start this off, uh, you're up in Nunavut, I take it right now. Maybe you can tell us how you got to Nunavut. Oh, certainly. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's an interesting uh, story, but. Uh, a long one, but I'll keep it nice and short. Um, as a police officer, I started my career actually in Nova Scotia. As a, as a general duty police officer and then uh, a drug enforcement officer and then major crime. And then uh, my wife and I just uh, were looking for that experience. We were looking for that quintessential RCMP experience, uh, which was policing in the north. Um, all the stories of old and ancient stories of the RCMP always seemed to be about uh, policing in the Arctic. And uh, we decided that that was something we wanted to do. So we put our names forward to, to go forward. And uh, and then we ended up in Nunavut in 2014, and we've been here ever since. Oh, it's interesting. <clears throat> and when do you uh, show up in Squamish or in the Sea to Sky Corridor? Uh, that's uh, coming very quickly now. Uh, it's been uh, one of those things where uh, everything kind of moves forward and you think things are moving along slowly and then all of a sudden the engine picks up steam. So um, I will be landing uh, on the ground uh, after driving across country uh, on the 19th of April. So my first day in the office is going to be the 21st and um, I'll be uh, spending a fair amount of time uh, back and forth between uh, the various communities and looking forward to meeting everybody in person when I can. Good. Uh, council, any members of uh, council have any comments or questions? Mayor Elliott. Good to see you again, Inspector. Um, uh, I wonder, I mean, I've had the opportunity to have a couple of conversations with you, but it would be great for council to just hear a little bit about the leadership style that you are bringing to the Sea to Sky, um, and and your approach to to leadership um, for the detachments that are here.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, having a little bit of internet issues, which is pretty typical here for the North. So hopefully everybody can hear me and see me still. Um, it's leadership is something I'm passionate about. Uh, it's something that I've uh, been working on for many, many years. I think if anybody who is a is a leader or wants to be a leader, it's a never ending uh, process of, of learning. Uh, in in a in short form, I mean, my approach to leadership is, is servant oriented, and what I mean by servant oriented in the sense that um, it's not about my way and only my way. For me, I see myself as a supporter and and a servant to those who um, I'm responsible for. Um, in terms of making sure that they're well cared for, that they have the resources and support that they require so that they can continue uh, to be able to do, uh, which is the main focus uh, of, you know, what our organization does is provide community policing services to uh, the Sea to Sky Corridor and the communities in which we serve. Um, very much an, an open leader in the sense that, um, I, you know, very open to ideas and, and new ways of doing business and, and, and listening to people and, and hearing about, you know, what their perspectives are and, and balancing all those uh, when making decisions. Um, yeah, servant leadership is, is, the, is the best way to say it. Um, you know, I take very to heart um, that I'm responsible for um, and responsible to a, a large number of, of members of the RCMP, but also uh, to the communities which um, I'm going to be serving um, as the OIC. And so uh, it's, it's incredibly important to me um, that I take it from the approach that I'm there to serve. And so as a result, it includes a, a very inclusive uh, approach to things. And have you been in the uh, city sky area before, or Inspector? Um, you know, I've, I've been there twice, um, but the, the most recent time was in 2018. My wife and I actually came out uh, to BC to visit some friends of ours that live in Kelowna. And my wife had never been to British Columbia before, and I love the mountains. Uh, I lived in uh, Victoria for two years when I went to university many, many, many moons ago when I was at Royal Roads Military College. And, um, and she had never been before, and she was just taken aback uh, by the stunning beauty of the area. Um, it was she's a very outdoorsy person. Uh, she very much hiking and camping is something that she loves to do. Um, and just to see the scenery and and the trees and the mountains and stuff were just so stunning for her. Immediately, she was this is where we need to go. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, we'll see if we can get there someday. Um, but uh, it's obviously happening. But immediately, you know, in 2018, she starts doing her research, uh, starts learning about the area herself, and I start to look into different aspects of the area as well. And uh, and uh, we're very much looking forward to getting there and setting down some roots, which has been very difficult to do with the RCMP. I'm, I'm hoping to set some roots down. <laughs> do you know uh, which community you will be living in? Uh, my forest house is going to be uh, in Whistler. Uh, that's where I'll be living. Um, but I'm going to be spending, um, you know, uh, I'd say, you know, a large amount of my time going back and forth between Squamish and Whistler uh, and visiting all the different communities and partners in the whole area. I think one of the things I'm starting to realize is that the challenge in um, in this particular role is that there's I have such a large, diverse group of partners um, that that we're you know, accountable for, I'm responsible to. But what's really great about that is I have uh, some very intelligent, capable, and smart uh, NCOs and uh, and officers that are already providing services to the communities. So I'm gonna be relying on them quite heavily to inform me in terms of what uh, the key issues are. Um, but I'm planning on spending, uh, you know, I'm working a five day week, so at least three days a week uh, in one office and two in the other and then switching every week. And then obviously if I need to spend more time in any particular area, I'll spend more time there um, as, as required. Okay. Uh, Council, any questions? No. Uh, Staff Sergeant Bradley, any comment or question? 
Yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, and uh, happy to see Council and uh, Mayor and everybody else on online right now. It's uh, great. Uh, just about to head off after this to Porto Cove. So hopefully the weather will hold in. Um, but I'm super excited to have uh, Robert uh, uh, make his way down and uh, hit the ground running here in, uh, in a few weeks. Um, we've prepped everything, hopefully. Uh, to a high level, so he can uh, just seamlessly fit right in, and obviously we'll be helping him along the way for the first little bit here. So uh, pretty excited to have him come down. So, okay, and staff, go ahead and slide in. Thank you, um, to the chair. Um, welcome, Robert. It's nice to see you again. Um, and appreciate the, the challenges with your internet connection. We've experienced those before, but uh, it will be great to meet you in person. We're very much looking forward to that. Um, one thing that I think both um, the public watching and council would love to hear is um, I was really moved by some of the passions that you pursue outside of, of policing, which I think really speaks to you as, as a leader, as a, as a person. And if maybe you want to share some of those before we close, I think that would be fabulous. Absolutely. I mean, you know, as I've spent a lot of time here in Nunavut, I mean, we're very isolated community here. And so you have to, uh, you have to become quite uh, aware of what you like to do and what's interesting outside of the office as well. And uh, I've developed some pretty strong passions for, uh, for two things in particular. One of them is uh, amateur DJ, which sounds really kind of silly, but uh, um, I absolutely love music and uh, and I'm actually kind of hoping that I can do some gatherings with uh, the membership at some point and do some uh, some DJ. But just you know, being involved and engaged in music and, and playing music for other people has been something that I've really uh, enjoyed. It's it's really helped with uh, maintaining my own mental health. Um, and music is just I found one of those things that joins people together. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're listening to, country, rock, electronic music. It doesn't really matter. It brings people together. So um, it's something I'm really passionate about and enjoy. And then the other thing I picked up quite uh, uh, quite a bit since I've been up here is photography. Um, it's something I was never really uh, good at or something I never really tried my hand at before. Uh, but since being up here and seeing the beautiful sceneries, I, I decided to, to pick that up. And uh, and I've been uh, you know pursuing that ever since for the last several years. And um, one of the things I'm really looking forward to to doing and and sharing when I'm in uh, the Sea to Sky area is my photography. Um, taking pictures of people and landscapes and and activities it's it's just something I, I really enjoy and uh, I, I find that uh, pictures just they're just a snapshot in time of something that's happening but the, they're compelling and uh, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot more of that when I get there Thank you. Uh, Council any final comments questions nope we'll wait to see you in person Thank you very much for joining us this morning, Inspector, and we look forward to seeing you in person when, when we're hopefully able to do that soon. Uh, and have a good voyage over here for a safe trip over Absolutely. Here. Thank you. And thank you, Staff Sergeant. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Looking forward to seeing you in person. Okay. <clears throat> and with this, that council, we will now move on to item four, sub two. Uh, Lower Mainland LGA call for resolutions and nominations. Uh, so we'll start, start with the resolution portion of that. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Mayor Elliott, although I didn't warn her about this, but the resolution that is in the agenda, I believe she has something to do with. And I'll let Mayor Elliott explain that. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the resolution, uh, on the agenda was passed by the village of Pemberton. So Mayor Richmond and I have been talking, we have similar issues around um, uh, getting new spaces built and both of our applications to the new spaces fund uh, were rejected because the province has set a cost per space threshold of $40,000. And, and they did that for legitimate reasons. They were trying to get as many spaces built as quickly as possible with the funds that that they had available. Um, there is a clause, however, that they introduced um, in late 2020 that said um, 
uh, applications with cost per space that are above the $40,000 threshold would be considered in exceptional circumstances um, and where there is a need. And so Mayor Richmond and I both um, have had our applications rejected, but thought that um, uh, the reasons that our costs were higher than the $40,000 actually represented those exceptional um, circumstances. And so um, Mike and I, Mayor Richmond and I had an opportunity to talk a little bit about the resolution. Um, their council uh, met before ours, and so um, they have approved this one. I'm, I think that it reflects Pemberton very, very well, um, but I think the wording at the end may not capture exactly um, what we're seeking because their resolution ends with the statement that the new spaces funding criteria allow for submissions of proposals that exceed the current $40,000 per space funding limit. And in fact, they do. Um, I think what we need to ask the government for is to clarify uh, what aspects they consider exceptional circumstances um, and, and how, how we would meet those. And so for us, um, those have been the fact that we are partnering with the school district and um, all but one of our schools are in the flood plain. So we have flood construction level um, and flood mitigation costs that are inherent with any build that we do. And we've already built um, a preschool space up at Garibaldi Highlands Elementary. So that one sort of, that box has been ticked. And so we were focusing on, on Valley Cliff. Um, our, uh, we're also paying a premium for trades. Um, and so if you consider uh, what we've seen in our own projects and the cost of construction escalating. So because of the tight labor market, we're having to bring in trades from the lower mainland, uh, which costs more. Um, so that has escalated our prices. Uh, the price of lumber has uh, increased substantially. Um, and then you pay, and then we have a near zero um, commercial vacancy rate. So it's very difficult for us to, or other providers to find space that they can convert to childcare. Um, and finally, um, many of our public buildings, which is where the province wants these, these new daycare spaces to sit, is in public hands, uh, primarily. Um, uh, most of the buildings that we would look at are at or near end of life or need major refurbishment. So in the short term, that hasn't been an option for us to um, add something to City Hall or um, Brennan Park in the short term. So, um, so that's kind of the exceptional circumstance piece. And then around the need, uh, we have our childcare needs assessment that was finished uh, in 2018. And so it was a five-year plan, 2018 to 2023. Uh, it demonstrates that to move our community from a 21% access rate uh, for children for childcare, and to get that to 30%, we would need to create 72 new spaces per year for 10 years, just to get to the 30% access rate. Um, so, so we believe that the, the growing community, our rising, um, population of children, uh, which we don't see uh, slowing down anytime soon. The in-migration of people, so they're moving away from family supports is also um, creating a higher childcare need because people can't fall back on, on a grandparent uh, in many cases in, um, in Squamish. And the high cost of living is, um, and high cost of land is preventing um, the development of more childcare spaces. So with all that, um, I think that we should pass a slightly different uh, motion than what Pemberton has has said here. Um, and um, I think the wording is somewhat along the lines of, um, therefore be it resolved that the ministry acknowledge communities. I'm not sure acknowledge is that the ministry clarify um, what meets the definition of exceptional circumstances so that communities with cost per space above the threshold 
um, can still be successful in in their applications. That's a bit wordy, but um, but I'm I'm kind of open to hearing some other thoughts from council at this point. And while I maybe think of of better words for our resolution. Okay, council. I have council Pettengill, council French. Yeah, thank you, Mary Ellie. And and based on what you said, I, I just wonder if it would also be worth uh, somehow. Uh, specifying our expectations of what qualifies as exceptional because I, I at the end of the day even if they clarify they could still clarify that we don't qualify which i don't think is the outcome we're looking for and so identifying the sorts of things we're struggling with uh, in in the resolution i don't know how specific we can get because it needs to be broad for uh lm lga and, and ubcm but um something that identifies what we consider exceptional uh, makes sense to me Council French. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I too feel strongly about this resolution and uh, certainly support it. So um, previously uh, in this exercise, we submitted a number of resolutions for consideration at um, the Lower Mainland Government Association and ultimately UBCM. And, uh, you know, there's very long standing tradition that many resolutions submitted just don't go anywhere. And uh, I feel so strongly about this issue that I'd like for us to put all of our effort in, into this. Uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't feel the need to um, um, put energy into any other resolutions. You know, we, as the mayor pointed out, we have a clear and strong need in our community and we need to think about the unborn children um, that are going to need care. When, when they do finally arrive. And uh, just the uh, thought on the specific dilemma that we're struggling with, I certainly support unique language to our resolution that reflects the struggles that we're having here in Squamish. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Uh, further comments? That's an interesting point. And I will uh, just add a little bit, um, let's see a council Um I did hear in the CBC this morning, or not this morning, a couple of days ago, actually, price of lumber alone has tripled uh, in the last year from 300 something to almost a thousand per, I think it's thousand board feet or something like that. Uh, quite a significant jump and not expected to drop anytime soon was the other comment they made. Uh, it'll take a couple of years for that to kind of level out and perhaps get back to more normal levels. So there certainly are uh, a number of Things that conspire against us when we're trying to fit it within that budget. Uh, Council Stoner. Yeah, just generally, I was going to say I'm supportive of the direction of this motion. Um, and I support the mayor's suggestion that we just clarify the last clause in the resolution um, that specifically asked the ministry to clarify the criteria for submissions above 40,000. And what meets exceptional circumstances, I think that uh, just makes this particular motion a little bit more specific on what it is that we're actually asking the ministry to do. I'm trying to craft some language here that would actually be helpful to put on the floor. <laughs> That's what Anderson. Case, um, it may be advisable to narrow our request down a bit because clarifying exceptional circumstances might be kind of an open field for the recipients of the resolution. I just, uh, Mayor Elliott has referred to three themes or and maybe there were others, but uh, we can <clears throat> include, for example, with, re with reference to floodplain construction costs, local construction labor markets, and community demographics affecting childcare. If that may be a consideration to narrow it down a bit, give them something to bite on or that we come away with some kind of answers on these themes. I just put that forward as a suggestion to include that clause. Thank you, uh, Mara, go ahead. Thank you, Council. These are all great suggestions. So I think um, to Councilor Anderson's point, where resolutions for LMLGA are allowed two whereas clauses and one therefore. So um, the second whereas says 
uh, many rural and remote communities in BC face higher than average construction costs, including additional hazard mitigation and flood construction level requirements. And I wonder if there's if there's anything else we want to add to that clause um, or whether that sort of covers it. Um, it also says we face a high unmet community demand for safe, affordable and licensed child care facilities, which we have that through our um, child care needs assessment. So, um, so I think the details we would have to fit into the whereas clause and then the ask we would just need to clarify in the therefore be it resolved clause around um, uh, maybe specifying that exceptional circumstances include higher than average construction costs, uh, additional hazard mitigation and flood construction level requirements, and a proven unmet community demand for safe, affordable, and licensed childcare. Something like that. Would that get us closer? The other, the other thing that you didn't have in that last sentence was the labor market. Um, and I think that is a significant factor uh, when you're, when you get away from the large metropolitan areas, uh, you do have much localized, much more localized markets. And so I think that would be significant. And so I would be inclined to include that in that paragraph. It's certainly a factor here. So we would perhaps say uh, acknowledge communities contending with defensibly. So we kind of need to so change this up. So be therefore be it resolved that the ministry clarify or define exceptional circumstances to include. And then list the things we've mentioned to ensure that communities who can't reach the 40,000 per space threshold can successfully, um, I don't know, build new childcare spaces. It's a week ending, but that's kind of where I'm going with, with the therefore clause. Okay, so see the concern look on Ms. Murray's face over here. So the resolution, looking at what's on the agenda, um, so the first, just on the first page, the council supports the following resolution to be submitted jointly with the village of Pemberton instead of District of Squamish. The first whereas is unchanged. The second whereas then, if I hear you correctly, would also be unchanged. And then the therefore be it resolved clause would read that the Minister and Ministry of Children and Family Development clarify and define for communities contending with defensible higher than average construction costs and evidence unmet child care needs by updating, et cetera. Does that capture it? I'm not sure we need all of those words there. Okay. I think it should be therefore be it resolved that the Minister of State for Child Care and the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Well, sorry. Um, so, first of all, are there two ministries here? Yeah. Well, there's one ministry, MCFD, and then there's a Minister of State for Child Care. And I think we should address them both in our resolution because I believe Minister Chen has the ability to redefine these or define further clarify exceptional circumstances, but she sits within the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Okay, so let me just deal with that point. So it's be resolved that the ministers, plural, and the Ministry of Children and Family Development and the Ministry of, what was it called? No, it's the Minister of State for Child oh. Care. Um, maybe work with the Ministry of Children and Family Development to define exceptional circumstances to include our list to ensure that communities um, that can't meet the $40,000 space 
limit still receive funding. Help. <laughs> Councilor Stone is in my office, so I'm I'm looking there to save my brain here. Okay. Be resolved that the Minister of State, Minister of State for Child Care, and the Minister and Ministry of Children and Family Development, etc. You got it that, did that far? Okay. And the next wording would be clarify. Define. 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 Okay. I think, think Councillor Stoner has some wording. Okay. Take it away, Councillor Stoner. So I think we can go with uh, define the, the criteria that would meet exceptional circumstances. I have for applications allowed to exceed the current $40,000 per space funding limit to include at a minimum flood and other hazard construction mitigation, low commercial vacancy rates, high property costs, and high costs of commercial space and construction. Labor. And labor force. Okay. Uh, that's that the ministry and the minister define exceptional circumstances for applications allowed to exceed the current $40,000 per space funding limit to include at minimum the following points. And just for the record, you want to clarify those following points again, please? Yeah, of course. So that flood and other hazard construction mitigation costs low commercial vacancy rates, high property costs, high costs of commercial space, uh, and labor force constraints. And then do we continue on with the wording to allow for the submission of proposals that exceed the current 40,000 or do we need that? We don't need that or we can shift it from the beginning of the clause to the end, whatever we prefer, whatever sounds better. Sounds perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, how about that? I'm off. Something's right there. Let's try that again. Can anybody hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. Um, I like uh, the change uh, that was mentioned in the middle there where um, so the applicants can be successful because we're still invited to apply uh, and we haven't been successful. So we want to make sure that we're not just uh, asking for the definition, but something that, that allows um, to lead to our success. So I think the, uh, and I, I like having that, that wording in there because um, just that success wording rather than just apply and redefine. I don't know where that fits in. Um, Throwing more words at Councilor Stoner, I can see you're writing. So I think what you're saying is to keep the words to allow for the submission of proposals that exceed the current forty thousand per space funding limit, and put that right at the very end. Is that fair enough? Yeah, but um, so they don't know what well, because it's not the, the issue isn't so much that we're to allow for submission, it's allow for successful submission. Okay. Because we've been applying, but we haven't been meeting the. Councilor Pettengill. You're muted. Sorry, thank you. Uh, one additional thought, and I agree with, with um, you know, ensuring success or identifying that, that these be uh, sufficient for success in some manner. Um, the other and I don't want to complicate it, but is it worth clarifying our expectation as to whether or not the expectations we receive greater than the $40,000 funding, or would we be happy if, you know, if our costs were more than normal, we'd still qualify, they might cap the funding at 40,000 per space, but that would still take us a lot further along and we'd be okay with that. Um, I'm not sure. And, and the other thought is um, I didn't have any other resolutions to propose. And I'm wondering if it would make sense uh, for maybe Mayor Elliott and Councillor Stoner to 
you know, for us to take a 10 minute recess and just sort of uh, hash through some some wording. It seems like we might have some time for that. Uh, good suggestion, but I'll go to Mary Ellen first. Um, thank you, Chair. So, uh, if Council remembers correctly, we did receive UBCM funding for childcare spots at Valley Cliff um, to the tune of $850,000. And um, between our submission um, and three months later in hearing the news, uh, we didn't have enough money to build. And uh, unfortunately, our CAC policy no longer includes um, a child care reserve. Uh, so that's not in any place to support new child care bills, which is a reason we should review our CAC policy this year. Um, but no, without the full amount, there's there's no other capital funding that's in the school district's budget nor ours to to make up. You know, the, the current cost is now closer to 2 million. To build a facility that includes um, uh, infant and child, you know, infant and toddler program, as well as a three to five cohort in the floodplain, um, and make sure that it, you know. And I guess we could put up at code trailers kind of idea, but those aren't necessarily repairable or expandable or the type of quality space that parents are looking for. Um, I've heard from other communities that finding commercial space at the forty thousand. Per space threshold has been challenging and they end up um, only being able to put those in less ideal parts of the community uh, to meet the cost per space. So I, I don't think, uh, unless we, we decide we're gonna divert much of our capital budget to building childcare, we actually need the full amount covered. And that was the idea of the new spaces fund is that it covers the build, not a portion of the build. So we actually had to return the UBCM funds and then apply for the new spaces fund. And then partway, even though we lowered our budget uh, for the new spaces fund as much as we could, we were still unsuccessful. So this is the same issue that uh, Pemberton and others are having is we can't even get close to that threshold with our current circumstances. So I'm, I'm happy to take a 10 minute recess for, for Councillor Stoner and I to nut out some language here to bring back. That would probably be more efficient and more helpful to our minute taker. I think so. So uh, we'll do that. We'll come back at 20 after 10. Okay, thank you. And call this meeting back in order. We got slightly delayed with a travel log here in council chambers, so we won't go into that. Uh, Mary Elliott, did you make any progress? We did. It's amazing when you get to sort of think quietly with another person. So thank you for the suggestion, Council Pangale. Um, we have emailed our draft resolution to um, the minute taker, to Ms. Murray, and all of Council so that you can look at it if you'd like. Um, but uh, as it reads, so that the public can uh, understand what we're up to here, therefore be it resolved that the Minister of State for Child Care work with the Ministry of Children and Family Development to define exceptional circumstances within the new spaces funding criteria to include consideration of the impacts of the following. Demonstrated high need for more child care spaces, flood and other hazard mitigation construction costs, higher than average land, labor and construction costs, limited availability of public lands fit for child care use, low commercial vacancy rates, high cost of commercial spaces, to enable the approval of applications that exceed the current $40,000 per space threshold. Any comment from council? Um, so we would like to move that to allow that resolution to go forward. Am I correct in that process? Okay. Uh, so, Council, do I have a mover and seconder at that? Moved by Councilor Stoner, seconded by Councilor Pettengill. Any further discussion? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. So, according to the agenda, we would now embark on a recess again. Um, I don't propose to do that. Ms. Arthurs, are we ready to go with the tourism Spanish draft? Um. Mr. Pollock is on the minute taker. Yes, he's been. And I'm sure we're ready to go. 
Oh, there they are. I see the last one. There we are. Um, so with that, uh, we will move directly into tourism operating grant item five on the agenda staff reports. Molly, go ahead. Thank you, Council. Just let me get my presentation up. Are you able to see the slides? Yep. Excellent, thank you. So thank you chair and council and welcome members of the public. My name is Catherine Mulligan. I am the economic development officer for the district of Squamish. Today I'm joined also by Leslie Leak. She's the executive director of tourism Squamish. So Leslie is going to be available to answer questions following the presentation that may arise as a result of the presentation with respect to tourism Squamish and operations. So the objective of today's presentation is to seek approval from Council to enter into a partnership agreement with Tourism Squamish Society and provide Tourism Squamish with an operating grant to support the execution of their 2021 strategic priorities. So just to provide a brief overview of the organization, Tourism Squamish was established in 2009 as Squamish's Destination Marketing Organization, or DMO for short. And its mandate includes providing destination promotion, management, and destination development activities on behalf of the community. So since 2013, uh, Tourism Squamish has been contracted by the district to provide visitor services on behalf of the community. The total annual contract value has been $100,000 per year. And at present, contract terms are on a month-to-month -month basis with Tourism Squamish and then fall, um, Sorry, <laughs> at present contract terms are on a month to month basis. Uh, this is then the, the end of the contract term. Also, between 2015 and 2019, the district provided Tourism Squamish with an annual operating grant of $50,000. This grant lapsed in 2020, and instead, District Council endorsed a $25,000 grant to undertake a fall promotional campaign supporting COVID 19 messaging. At that time, Council also directed staff to identify a long-term funding approach to support Tourism Squamish's continued operations. So staff are recommending that Tourism Squamish be provided $150,000 in the form of an operating grant to support the implementation of their strategic priorities in 2021. This grant would be provided in the short term while visioning work is undertaken in 2021 related to the Squamish Adventure Center. Upon completion of the visioning, visioning work with Tourism Squamish, staff would intend to return to Council with long-term funding options. This grant would be prorated on payment, um, would be prorated based on payments the district has already made in 2021 related to the Visitors Information Services Agreement that's in force. The grant is also intended to support all three strategic pillars of the societies, including destination marketing, visitor experience, and destination development. However, the grant is intended to provide Tourism Squamish with greater flexibility in how funds are allocated across these areas. So to administer the grant, staff recommend um, executing a partnership agreement that sets out the purpose of the funding and provides an accountability framework for Tourism Squamish to report back on. Staff propose that Tourism Squamish report the following performance indicators no later than January 1st, 31st, 2022. So the number of visitor service interactions by source, information requested and type, the total number of ambassador service hours as an ambassador program is being established to support destination management in 2021, marketing performance related metrics that will be further defined by Tourism Squamish as part of this partnership agreement, and newer enhanced attributable tourism infrastructure um, or programs that are created during the year. And just a note that Tourism Squamish will report on overall performance, not solely related to the funding allocated by the district as programs and services and initiatives are funded via a variety of sources. 
So the grant falls within the district's budget for 2021 with 150,000 included within the 2021 to 2025 financial plan under economic development. As previously mentioned, staff will return to council at a later date to present options related to a multi-year agreement. And the grant supports policies part of Squamish's official community plan, including those that are focused on enhancing access to recreational amenities, services, and programming, protecting and capitalizing on the district's recreational assets to grow the local economy, and supporting diversified and sustainable economic growth. Specifically, this grant supports the strategic plan goals of increasing local employment opportunities and the number of target sector firms. Based on a recent tourism impact study conducted in partnership with Tourism Squamish and the Squamish Chamber, in 2018, Squamish's tourism sector supported 788 jobs and contributed 95.2 million in visitor spending. As such, staff proposed the following council resolutions. That the District of Squamish terminate the Adventure Center Visitor Information Services Agreement with Tourism Squamish Society, dated for reference December 19, 2013, as amended, and that the District of Squamish execute a partnership agreement with Tourism Squamish Society and approve a grant of 150,000 for the Society's 2021 strategic plan implementation. So should council approve, the district will enter into this partnership agreement with Tourism Squamish in order to administer the funds. So thank you and Leslie and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Could you go uh, remove your presentation please so I can get my, my grid back? Thank you. Uh, Council, any questions? Council Cadmiel. Yeah, so a couple on the slide before the uh, the resolution, it was a list of the things I think we would evaluate the success on. I saw the OCP and a few other things. I didn't see our climate action plan. I'm just wondering if you can speak to why that's not on there. And maybe you, you mentioned it and I just missed it, but it didn't show up on the list. Hi, through the chair. Um, the slide I think that you're speaking to is the considerations slide. Um, the evaluation um, is actually this, just the slide before, and um, that's part of the partnership um, agreement formation, and it's metric-based um, in terms of Tourism Squamish's performance for the year. Um, the considerations that are provided are what was included within the council report. Um, and what was it was focused on was how it aligns to council strategic priorities. And sorry, if I can follow up that, I, I think the climate action plan, I mean, we have a strategic pillar around that. And so I'm wondering if that belongs there with the other items. Through the chair in relation to how the agreement will support climate action or? Yeah, like uh, it, I saw, you know, alignment with the OCP and our um, economic, um, uh, can't remember the, the term, but, you know, some of our other policies. And that was, a, a, it seems, one of our key strategic areas of focus that, that seemed to be missing there. And um, it in the uh, objectives from Tourism Squamish, the synopsis we got, they do mention uh, thinking about climate action and so on. So it's identified by Tourism Squamish. And, and so it seemed to make sense to mention it uh, from our end, at least to me. Thank you um, for the clarification. Um, through the chair, uh, yes, I mean, I know Leslie's Weeks can probably speak more directly in terms of uh, the programming services initiated in 2021 and how they support um, climate priorities of the district. I think probably through one of the main areas would be around destination management. Um, Leslie, I don't know if you have anything to add in there. Go ahead, Ms. Weeks. Um, no, nothing to add. You're, you're correct, um, Kate. We, we do speak to that in, um, in what we're doing around destination management. And certainly, Councillor Pettingill, we could add that in as a consideration on, under the performance metrics. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stoller, Councillor Herford. Thank you, through the chair. I'm just wondering if staff can clarify between the visitor information services uh, contract and the additional operational grant that was provided um, in previous years, something in 2019 and 2020, how much have we provided to tourism Squamish? And is 
there a difference between previous year's funding levels and the current act? Through the chair, um, in 2019, the district provided $100,000 through the Visitor Inf um, Information Services Agreement and another 50,000 in grant. In 2020, it was a total of 125,000 as the grant had lapsed in 2020. Um, however, council elected in the fall to provide 25,000 to Tourism Squamish. Thank you for the clarification. No problem. Uh, Councilor Herbert. Thank you. Um, in the staff report, it, it mentions the, uh, the, the visitors information um, services uh, will, tourism exposure will have more flexibility to deliver those. I, I believe it's one of the goals here. Is, are we going to see more for how, what effect is that going to have in, in the actual operations of visitor information services? Is it is it uh, same same hours? Is there uh, same overall hours distributed differently? Is there reduction in hours? What what's proposed there? So through the chair, I'd like to be able to provide Leslie the opportunity to talk about implementation of visitor services. But the goal of the agreement is to provide greater flexibility in terms of how um, tourism squamishes implement uh, their strategic plan, and so that provides greater flexibility in terms of. Um, meeting the needs of visitor services throughout the community based on their understanding and experience um, as a in the role of a DMO. So Leslie, I don't know if you want to provide greater clarification there. Go ahead, sure. Um, I think, uh, you know, to Kate's point, what we were hoping for this year was a funding envelope that allowed us flexibility to be a bit more nimble in how we spent the funds based on what was happening. And um, what we're seeing right now is uh, less people coming into the visitor center, but more people being out and about around the community. So the strategy for this year is to get more boots on the ground as destination stewards to help with visitor dispersion um, geographically throughout the community, as well as uh, visitor education. So that's that's the plan for this year. And then we'll adapt that based on what we're starting to see and as travel restrictions start to ease. Um, but we'll be a little more nimble with how we can move people around and where we can position people. We'll still have people in the building and, and maintain our hours at, for visitor servicing in the Adventure Centre and bricks and mortar locations, but we'll have more people out around in the community. Thank you. Yeah, just going back to uh, Councilor Stone's question, um, I can remember just weeks ago, remember this. Um, Tourism Squamish became independent of the district, uh, I think in my first term, uh, 2010 or so, if I recall correctly. And at that time, I think the, for five years, uh, the district supported it for numbers that I think started off at around $100,000 a year, in addition to the monies going to the Visitor Information Service. And then that reduced down to $50,000. Uh, over five years, and it's kind of, from my experience, sort of hovered around the $50,000 level uh, pretty much since then, in addition to the money uh, that's been going to the BRICS, uh, which has been approximately 100,000 years that we pull shows. So that, what we're talking about here is more or less in the same context. It's just, just being allocated slightly differently. Uh, Council, any other comments or questions? Council Pettengill. Yeah, so two more. Um, one, it, it does talk about uh, pandemic recovery as, as one of the things to be considered. Um, and I, I guess I'm just looking to understand as I, um, some of, of what I'm seeing is that the expectation is that COVID may be more like the flu where it, it's, we're not where we are, but it's not something that goes away. And, and so between that um, and, you know, we know that pandemics are a, a feature, we'll say, of climate change and so on. So I'm just wondering if, if as a community, we should be thinking more about um, sort of, you know, some sort of recovery, but pandemics or this sort of situation as an ongoing, you know, what does tourism look like uh, in the future because of things like this? And, you know, to my mind, we actually have significant opportunity compared to other communities because our tourism is very outside focused and so on. We're not like a, an amusement park where everyone's crammed together, but just sort of, 
I was wondering about articulating that and, and giving at least that some thought in what we're doing moving forward, as opposed to, as I read it, sort of an assumption that this will just all go away and, and how do we cover it once it's all gone kind of thing. I, I don't know if there's any, I appreciate you hearing some thoughts about that. Um, through the chair, I think that uh, for the purpose of this agreement, this is meant to be a short duration agreement. Um, and uh, Tourism Squamish is in the, I think in the best seat in terms of being able to answer um, its strategic focus moving forward. Um, but for this particular agreement, um, this is really to um, get us through a process with Tourism Squamish where we're going to be um, considering um, a vision for the future operations of the Squamish Adventure Center. And we want it to complete that work prior to coming back with a long-term um, funding option or options for consideration. Um, but in terms of the question at hand, I think that that's a larger question that's more strategic in nature in terms of how Tourism Squamish um, is focused on developing um, the tourism sector in Squamish, as well as managing um, from a destination development and management perspective. So Leslie, I don't know if you want to add in there anything. Um, not really at this time. I, I Certainly that's something that we're thinking about, Councillor Pennygill, just how, um, you know, what recovery looks like in the long term, which um, this will not be going away. So how we handle that as a tourism industry as a whole is certainly something that we're looking at. I can't really answer exactly what that'll look like yet, but it is on our radar and we can certainly have a conversation about that um, at another time. Thank you. And, and, uh, my, my other question is Mulligan and you touched on it a little bit. I'm just wondering if I get a little more clarity on how this fits into how or when we're working on the longer term funding strategy. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly clear and, and comfortable with what's proposed for this year. I'm just wanting to understand a little bit um, and we've seen changes in terms of STRs and, and, and all those funding sources plus the pandemic and so on. So I understand there's a lot of challenges, but how are we, um, I, I guess, just like to understand a little bit better about when or how we're getting to that longer term funding plan. And is that coming out of this? Is that one of the deliverables? It doesn't seem like that's a particular focus of this project, but maybe I misunderstood that. Through the chair, um, this is um, so the 2020, um, sorry, the 2021 funding um, recommendation is is really the, in the form of a grant where the district is providing a grant for tourism Squamish to undertake its strategic priorities in 2021. So the strategic plan that's been attached to the report um, are outlines what those priorities are in 2021. Um, the project with respect to, to visioning for the Squamish Adventure Center is, is really focused on the center itself and the center's operations, but we need to get that work completed. Um, I think it would be staff in staff best interest to provide a better, stronger recommendation to get that work completed with Tourism Squamish before making such a recommendation. Um, I think that it, what, what you're suggesting probably falls within um, Tourism Squamish's strategic priorities moving forward, which is separate of the work that we're doing for, for the visioning for the Adventure Center. But it could be a consideration moving forward in terms of that long-term funding and the alignment that Tourism Squamish's strategic plan has in relation to the community's objectives that are articulated in, such as in um, the official community plan or council strategic plan. Okay, thank you. And, and for clarity, I wasn't suggesting that should be bundled into these projects necessarily. I was just sort of understanding, wanting to understand when that's coming or when we're expecting to work on that. So through the chair, when we come back, um, I'm guessing in the late fall um, to council, uh, I can't be certain, but uh, with different options for a long-term funding model, um, at that point, there would also be uh, probably a, a, taking a closer look at uh, the plans that Tourism Squamish has moving forward in relation to that long-term funding model, and then how those plans 
tie in to um, community objectives, policy, and so on. It would be part of that process. I have Councilor Stiller, Mayor Elliott. Um, I guess just a simple, quick reframe of potentially Councilor Pettengill's question. Do we anticipate that we'd be able to see those potential long-term funding strategies as part of the 2022 budget, or do we expect that to fall into the subsequent budget year? At this point, um, given the amount of work that we have ahead of us and our timelines, um, <laughs> We would like to be able to uh, incorporate that into 2022, and I'm not sure if Gary's on the line, um, Gary Buxton, but we would like to be able to incorporate that into 2020, 2022's consideration for budget. Uh, it will depend on sort of where we're at in the process around visioning. I don't have anything to add to that. Yeah, Mr. Buxton's here and, and has nothing to add to that. Okay. It's also, uh, in addition, it's not just the vision, but sort of what did the operations look, um, look like moving forward, um, also for the Adventure Center. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Just one thing for, for Council's consideration is that we don't have a crystal ball about how this market um, will recover. We don't know when the borders were open. We don't know um, any of those things. And so I think to drive towards when will we have that long-term funding model is, is actually getting ahead of ourselves. And in fact, we, I think we should be open to the fact that we might have another year of a one-year agreement to allow for more stability to return to the market because we're basically asking our, our tourism operator to predict the future and predict the model that will sustain them over multiple years. And it might be that we need another year of, of, of sort of interim funding to, to see how this plays out. We know lots of visitors are coming, um, but it'll still be regional visitors this summer for the most part. And, and those aren't the ones driving, you know, an increase in the MRDT necessarily, or, um, the other funding sources for tourism squalor. So we've got to be really careful, I think, about saying it has to be in the 2022 budget. Something has to be in the 2022 budget. Um, but I, I would say I'm not married to it being the long-term plan. I think we should be closer to seeing what that is by the end of this year through that work. But I don't want to drive us to a false timeline if there's still a lot of uncertainty in the tourism marketplace about when visitors are coming back and how. Um, and, and I think that is shifting. So I just want us to, to stay open to the idea that, it, you know, we're in, we're in transition. And, and so maybe our funding model should reflect that for a little bit. But thanks for your presentation and for being here, Ms. Weeks. Thank you. Uh, Council, any further comments or questions? Council Herford? I was going to move the staff recommendation. Okay. Uh, there's a motion on the floor for the staff recommendation. Is there a seconder? Councillor Anderson? Anybody wish to speak to that? Councillor Herbert? Um, uh, yeah, thank you for everyone's uh, work on this. Uh, we're in uh, unprecedented times, and uh, um, and I think this is much, much needed to get us uh, through to what might be the other side or the version of whatever it is that, that happens next. So. Uh, thank you for everyone's flexibility and um, all the good work getting through this work. Thank you. Councillor Anderson, Councillor Pettengill. Yes, I'd like, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, applaud, if you like, uh, staff on the coherent workflow that I see before us here, the scheduling of plans and funding arrangements. I think it makes sense and it's a good logic to it. Secondly, I'm very pleased to see under the visitor experience goals is really new territory for tourism Squamish, which has for the most part been preoccupied or mandated with uh, destination marketing. So under that uh, section, we have new product development, if you like, the second uh, bullet, and, and, and also uh, to quote, enhancing tourism infrastructure and amenities. This is new responsibilities and challenges for tourism Squamish, and it will involve new partnerships, not least with the district. And um, this is, uh, I think, uh, will also touch on the, uh, the 
planned process for the Adventure Center, the re re renewal, if you love the Adventure Center and its precinct, adjacent parks, amenities, and trails. Um, so this is very exciting to look forward to. Um, and uh, with respect to Councillor Pennigal's point on climate action, I'll just finally point out that that is referenced in that uh, visitor experience goals is explicit, and that will mainly tie in or also tie into um, active transportation measures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pendil, Councillor French. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to support this. I do understand these are, are challenging times. And, and just for clarity, my questions about understanding the longer term, uh, I know there's a lot of variability right now and we, we can't predict. And so I just wanted to understand what our current thinking is and, and sort of where we are. And, and it may be that, um, you know, the next time we have this discussion, it, it is still, we're still trying to figure this out. And so I just wanted to have that kind of understanding of, of what our, our current uh, frame of mind is on these things. And I appreciate the uh, responses. And uh, just also reiterate that I am a firm believer that where there's challenge, there is also opportunity and our tourism sector is really important. And I do see a lot of opportunity here for us despite the challenge and uh, thank Tourism Squamish for their hard work. Thank you. Uh, Councillor French. Thanks, Chair. And speaking in favor of the motion, uh, I want to acknowledge the really great work that Ms. Weeks has been doing with her team and uh, the fine effort coming from Ms. Mulligan and the economic development um, team. Uh, these certainly have been challenging times, and those challenges will continue for at least the next um, six months, and, and I'm expecting far beyond. So, I think that the flexibility that's being delivered uh, with the move that we're making is really important at this point. So uh, I um, support this motion. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and I will also be supporting this. As I mentioned in my earlier comment, I think this amount of money uh, is quite in line with the context uh, of support that we've provided to the Visitor Information Center and Tourism Squamish over the last few years. And so it doesn't, in my mind, represent a significant departure from that. Uh, and I agree with the mayor. I think um, this is certainly a one-year deal. Um, it may turn into being a one-year deal the following year as well, um, because long-term strategy is a little bit hard to define uh, where you're starting from right at the moment, and, and maybe not even by the end of this year. So, uh, so it may be that we do want to extend it. Uh, but I'm comfortable with the amounts of money. Certainly the relationship with tourism and Squamish has been very productive, I think, for the community over the years. Uh, I'm happy to support this. Uh, further comment, Council? I'll call the question. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, according to the agenda, uh, we would be breaking now for lunch. Uh, we are somewhat ahead of time. Um, I hate to say it, but you guys aren't talking very much this morning, so not as much as planned. We're just checking that nature about scalable, but we're checking on it in Falcon, and we can consult with Canada and we're going to make some So hang on just a couple of seconds, don't oh, leave. Okay, and so we're, the consultant's not available until 1 p.m., so we're just checking to see if the team is out of the house. Okay. So we might just give them one break just to get everything around. Okay, so I don't know if you heard that. So I had hoped to have everything um, maybe continue on until noon. Uh, but the draft wildfire development permit area has a consultant who is not available until 1 p.m. So what we are trying to do is bring the seniors issue forward. Uh, so there's only one issue this afternoon. Uh, we're just making those arrangements. So I'll ask for a 10 minute recess. Uh, we'll come back and carry on from there. Thank you and welcome back. Um, so council, we will uh, have the seniors item, which is item. Five sub three on the agenda, seniors recreation programming engagement plan. Um, and then we will break for lunch um, and come back at one o'clock just so we're aware of upcoming schedule. It's Mr. Hoskin. Uh, the, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ray. So it'll actually be me that's presenting today. I'm just going to share my screen.
Okay, just confirming you have the right screen. Is it full screen? We can, but you're in presentation mode. We're in the uh, I'm just other notes and so forth around. Okay, I think that should be the correct one now. Um, so um, thank you, Council, uh, for your time today. My name is Sarah Dicker, and I am the Acting Manager of Arts and Culture for the District of Squamish. And I'm joined today by Tim Hoskin, who is the Director of Special Projects and Initiatives for the District. So on today's agenda, um, we're going to be discussing the objective of the Seniors Recreation Programming Engagement Plan, the background, the overview, a timeline for the project, and the next steps. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions. So the objective of today's presentation and of the report presented to Council is to present the Seniors Recreation Programming Engagement Plan for Council's review and endorsement. The background of this project is that the Westwinds MOU uh, Memorandum of Understanding was presented on September 29th. And that was for um, to direct staff to enter into a license agreement for the use of the building for seniors recreation programming. Council passed a resolution on October 6th that directed staff to enter into this MOU and to also broadly engage uh, with seniors in the community on recreation programming in three district facilities. Um, since then, staff have drafted an engagement plan and created and shared it um, amongst uh, some senior stakeholders. And um, we've incorporated feedback received from those stakeholders uh, where appropriate in the plan, uh, given the scope of the engagement. And we've also uh, received interest from about 25 seniors um, on uh, being involved in the process moving forward. So as part of this presentation, we'll just be focusing on the latter part of Council's resolution, um, which focuses on broadly engaging seniors on programming in the three facilities noted in the motion, the 55 Activity Centre, the West Winds Building, and the Brennan Park Recreation Center. So the project overview, um, the intent of this project is to focus on uh, residents age 55 plus and improve on expand and expand on seniors programming at municipal facilities with the overall intention of contributing to seniors quality of life. The scope is again um, to acqu acquire community group feedback from seniors on programming, which is exclusive, or sorry, which is inclusive and reflects on community needs and interests, and to provide rec recreational programming that best considers the social and physical well being of seniors and that moves towards a neighborhood hub, a neighborhood hub model. Um, so different types of seniors programming include social programming like events and gatherings such as card playing and lunches, um, health programming such as any Vancouver Coastal Health Initiatives, Neurofit, um, and then also traditional recreational programming such as um, activities including swimming, art, dance, and walking. Um, so different categories, um, and we're hoping to find the best um, place to hold them um, that seniors approve of and that is accessible to seniors in the community. Uh, and then the objective is to develop a plan that effectively implements recommendations from seniors um, on programming across municipal facilities. So the project timeline um, that we're, we're hoping to roll out, um, it goes from April um, and then basically it doesn't really end when we complete the, the engagement because we're, we'll be implementing it um, starting in the fall and, and onwards from there. So in April and May, we plan to um, advertise 
um, and engage seniors within the community uh, to form a steering group. And this will include a list of stakeholders um, identified by staff. And as well, it also looks to broadly engage um, seniors across the community. And we're hoping that as this is rolling out, vaccinations are rolling out too. And so that when we get into um, broadly engaging the community in June and coming to council with some findings in July, hopefully restrictions will maybe lift a little bit. And we intend um, as long as it is safe to do so, to hopefully be able to do a portion of our engagement in person, um, as well as using the tools that have proven successful um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic in virtually um, engaging with seniors. We have had, as I mentioned before, um, really good uptake so far with over 25 people already um, involved and wanting to be part of the steering group. So hopefully we'll continue to um, see success as we move forward. And then just digging deeper into this timeline. So in April, uh, we're looking for council approval of the engagement plan today um, with the ratification of that motion um, moving forward um, at, the, at the next council meeting. Uh, we want to, once we get that ratification of our motion we, or a resolution, we want to launch a web page and begin advertising. Uh, we'll form that steering group and derive process feedback from those um, individuals involved in the steering group. Um, in June, we'll begin our broad engagement. And then in July, we'll conclude um, our engagement and bring a report back to council on the findings uh, that we have um, concluded. And then uh, fall, we'll, we'll look to begin implementing that new programming um, and feedback in our existing municipal facilities. So that would be Brenham Park um, and also the 55, as well as district parks. Um, and then also include any recommendations within reason um, in the budget cycle for 2022 with the new West Wing building opening in fall 2022 and then implementing um, that feedback um, to make sure that we're providing the best programming that we can across municipal facilities and that it's suitable and accessible for, for those who want to join in. Um, and then our new programming structure will be implemented and we'll continue to uh, receive feedback and tweak as necessary. So the next steps, just again, um, our committee of the whole recommendation today will ratify that recommendation or council will ratify that recommendation if they're happy with it um, in April. Uh, then we'll begin our webpage and our advertisement um, and we'll launch the engagement plan. And so the staff recommendation today is that the District of Squamish Council endorse seniors recreation programming engagement plan as presented at the March 23rd, 2021 Committee of the Whole. And I'll be happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Decker. Uh, could you remove your presentation, please, so I can get my, my grid back? And then I have Councillor French. Councillor Anderson, go ahead, Councillor French. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a few questions. First is, um, has a number been established for the ideal uh, number of people to be on the committee that's proposed? Ms. Decker, go ahead. Thank you, Councillor um, Race through the chair. Um, Councillor French, we are aiming to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, we haven't established a specific number for the stakeholder steering, sorry, for the steering group. However, uh, yes, inclusivity is forefront and paramount. And so if we do get an uh, above the number that we're anticipating, we may um, look to break the steering group into a number of steering groups and move forward from there. But we'll base it on the, uh, on the, the interest that we receive. Okay, and I'd also like to get some insight into how many times these folks will meet? Is this just a one shot or uh, are we looking at two meetings or, or more than that? Thank you, Councillor, um, through the chair. 
We are probably looking at two to three meetings, um, depending on the, the number of people uh, we do end up taking on. Um, we're probably looking at presenting an initial plan and gaining some feedback. Um, and depending on how uh, much conversation happens or how long the meetings are, how much we get done um, in the first couple of meetings, maybe we'll follow up just to and make sure that we're we're on point with a third meeting, but probably one to two, and maybe if necessary, a third. Great, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Anderson. Thank you. I have two questions. Firstly, will the Senior Center Society be approached in the call out for prospective members of the steering group? Thank you uh, through the chair. Thanks for your question, Councillor Anderson. Yes, they they have been already engaged. They have provided feedback on the engagement plan and they'll continue to be engaged as part of the steering group. Thank you. My second question is that um, I'm looking at, at the staff report and your presentation. The emphasis is on programming, recreational, and of course you have included that's broadly conceived to include arts and dance and so forth. But the emphasis is on programming. So my question is, uh, will you be uh, looking for advice and input on issues of facility operations and design? Uh, these are matters that the Senior Center Society, among other individuals in the community, have brought forward uh, regarding all three facilities that have been highlighted. So facility operations and design. Thank you uh, for the through the chair, um, council's motion specifically directs staff to look into recreation programming. It's my understanding that we won't be looking for any further feedback, um, but I am willing to pass it over to Tim Hoskin if he wants to add further to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, chair and council. Um, yeah, certainly uh, if ideas come up, we have some opportunities with West Winds to uh, uh, look at uh, some of the features of what the programming space will look like. Uh, I don't think we want to dive into, uh, you know, paint colors and that sort of thing uh, when we're um, dealing with uh, such a large group. Um, but uh, certainly on the operations, how to set it up and make sure it's successful. And then uh, the same sort of thing would apply when uh, we develop the wellness center and uh, other infrastructure. Uh, we would certainly be doing broad engagement with seniors and others on optimizing what that facility could look like. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Councilor Benville. Yeah, thank you. I'm just wondering if I can get a bit more clarification on what we mean by programming. Uh, is it just sort of uh, there's a class, a, a step class at 10 a.m., or is it also just, hey, there's a place where you can sit down and, and have a coffee, and there's sort of that sort of uh, very unstructured, maybe you can call it programming or not, but is that sort of part of it, these other sorts of less formal things? Mr. Austin, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, certainly, we look at uh, social programming as uh, being part of this. So, uh, to be successful with the seniors, uh, it includes uh, events uh, such as their uh, holiday uh, dinner, um, uh, lunches, uh, just simply gathering for a coffee. Uh, the, these are all uh, uh, instrumental in being successful. So, uh, yeah, that social that social piece is certainly part of it. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments, Council, or questions? Okay. There is a recommended motion that we receive and endorse principles of engagement outline. Moved by Councillor Herbert, second by Councillor Anderson. Uh, any comment? Councillor Pendle, Councillor French. Yeah, thank you. I will be supporting this. I'm, I'm glad to see that we're, we're having these conversations. Um, just one thing I want to highlight, and I, I thought about this, I don't think it belongs in the considerations, which is why I didn't raise it, but I, I have asked the question where I am looking, you know, I've, I've been hearing from different people that the seniors made investments into infrastructure at the Activity 55, and I don't have a sense of what those were specifically. Um, and for me to uh, understand some of the feedback that comes back, I, I would hope to have some better understanding of that. So I'll just note that to staff. Um, I think it's just important that um, 
you know, I know lots of community groups have made investments in community infrastructure and so on. And, and I just want to make sure that we're uh, taking that into adequate consideration as we decide how we move forward. Um, but otherwise, I'm very glad to see this going forward with such uh, uh, attention to including uh, lots of perspectives. And thank you, Steph, for the work on this. Thank you. Councillor French. Thanks, Chair. And speaking in favor of the motion, uh, like Councillor Pettingill, I'm very much looking forward to a meaningful dialogue with uh, seniors in, in our community uh, around this issue. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seniors being active participants in this conversation. I, I think that there are a number of um, people in our community who have been looking forward to offering this input and will be valuable in, in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Stoner. Uh, I too am happy to support this motion and uh, encouraged to see this come forward. Uh, thank you for, to staff for putting forward a thoughtful uh, process for engagement uh, for a dialogue that I think is very important. Um, I'll just note that uh, on the timeline, I appreciate that we have become really uh, adept at online virtual engagement. If there is the opportunity and fingers crossed that the vaccination rolls out um, to do in some form of in-person, socially distanced outside, and that means that the timeline extends into August to allow that to happen, I think that that would be a thoughtful consideration, uh, just recognizing the breadth of ways that we know we can engage uh, more deeply uh, outside of virtual engagement. So happy to see that flexibility in there and otherwise encouraged by the conversations that are about to happen. Thanks. Thank you. Further comment? Seeing nothing, I'll follow a question. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and so that is the completion of the morning agenda. Uh, we will come back at one o'clock for the one item remaining on the agenda. Thank you and welcome back to the committee of the whole meeting for March 23rd. Um, we have one final item on the agenda. Let me just find it. This is item five sub two draft wildfire development permit, permit area. Uh, Ms. Phil for Mr. Gunn, is this the presentation? Thanks very much. I'll just queue up the presentation and Matt's going to start us off here. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Can yep. you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Matt Gunn and I'm co-presenting with Asia Phil. We are planners for the District of Squamish. Today, we are presenting an update regarding the proposed wildfire DPA that staff have been working on. Our objective is to present a draft and to solicit feedback on the proposal. Uh, I just want to start off by outlining the purpose of the DPA, which is to reduce wildfire hazard risk to public safety, property, and the district's forests. I'd like to provide a quick background to the project. A development of the DPA is a recommendation of the Community Wildfire Protection Plan that Squamish completed in 2017. Um, the staff have engaged um, EA Blackwell and Associates in the project to assist with bylaw development. Um, Bruce, who has been invited to the um, meeting, and I do we have him on on board at this point? Has he been made a, um, a attendee or a presenter? Um, Thank you, Matt. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, we've, we've engaged Bruce in the project um, and Bruce has drafted multiple wildfire DPAs in BC. Bruce, you may need to um, turn off your uh, microphone. Um, uh, Bruce has uh, drafted multiple wildfire DPAs in BC, brings a depth of knowledge and experience to this process. Uh, staff presented the project to Committee of the Whole in January of 2020. Uh, at that meeting, we outlined an overall approach and proposed DPA mapping, which is uh, highlighted on screen. That is the mapping that we presented in uh, January of 2020. Council comments at the time indicated the support for a high level of protection through the wildfire DPA and included direction to expand the DPA beyond the 100 meter buffer for forested areas to include areas, all areas, as protection against wind transported embers. So, if we go to the next slide, uh, as a result, the DPA is now proposed as applicable to two areas, 
the primary area, which is the pink area. Um, that's the area that's forested or within 100 meters of forested land. And a secondary built up area, uh, which is the area in yellow. And those has some relaxations in the guidelines for those areas. Um, development of the guideline has been informed by knowledge uh, of the project consultant, um, Bruce Blackwell, along with review of existing DPAs and other jurisdictions and discussion with planning staff at those agencies. Key elements for protection against loss include three main elements. First is fire resistant roofing. The second is fire resistant building components. And these include things such as cladding, decks, windows, eaves, soffits, fence, gutters, and chimneys. And the third is landscaping. And this involves a set of specific regulations that restrict how fire prone trees and shrubs can be used in the 10 meter priority one zone around buildings. It includes requirements for spacing of those plants and trees from each other and from buildings. And it discourages the use of three specific high risk trees and shrubs, juniper, cedar, and yew. Um, we've also uh, informed our bylaw uh, development through lessons from other jurisdictions. Um, most notably, the lessons relate to the challenges of implementation. Uh, things we heard about were capacity challenges in, in ensuring compliance and challenges in ensuring compliant landscaping over time. Uh, there are some significant trade-offs that have been considered in development of the proposed DPA. The first trade-off to discuss is the ease of administration of the DPA versus efficacy of the DPA and the guidelines. And several different approaches have been used for wildfire DPAs in BC. Some approaches rely heavily on a consultant report for development, similar to our, our riparian DPA process. And this is effective, but does have a high administrative burden. Um, some uh, DPAs rely heavily on registering a covenant on title. Uh, through, uh, and it, in some DPAs, it's actually an exemption to completing a DPA that if a covenant is registered, that um, the DPA does not be does not need to be pursued. Uh, and this has a lower administrative burden, but does have limited efficacy for some elements over time. So the proposed DPA that staff is bringing forward and the associated bylaws, um, which we'll go into detail about in a minute, are intended to reduce the burden while still providing a high level of protection from wildfire. A second trade-off that staff considered involves exterior building cladding materials. In this item, there are trade-offs around safety and the use of combustible materials such as wood and the associated aesthetics and environmental attributes. Um, again, the proposed guidelines that staff came up with came up with reflect an intention to provide a high level of protection to the community. The question of embodied carbon was raised by council prior to this meeting, so I want to briefly touch on that topic. Um, the project is directly related to climate change adaptation. A wildfire DPA was a specific aspirational policy identified in the adapting to climate change report produced by Dr. Pickett's prior to his time beginning work as a district as a district manager of sustainability and climate change. And with regard to mitigation, embodied carbon is a concept that does have relevance to wood siding products and construction. But in discussion with Dr. Pickett on the topic, he did note that embodied carbon isn't currently within the scope of our measured emissions inventory and that the CCAP doesn't provide any direction on how to address the topic. And this is in part because embodied emissions is really at the cutting edge component or it's, it's a cutting edge component of the mitigation landscape. Um, and then the DPA guidelines do specify non combustible materials for cladding. And so examples are asphalt shingles and hardy board siding. But it's important to note that wood products, which meet fire resistant classification, are acceptable. And so heavy timbers are also an acceptable exterior element. So they're not fully excluded from use on buildings. And it's also important to note that the guidelines are really specific to materials used in exterior cladding. They don't discourage the use of wood in the structure of the building. So in the walls, the joists, the floor panels, the internal roof structure. So there's a significant opportunity to use wood um, in, in a building that is impacted by the wildfire DPA. And then um, it, it is still, it, it is worth considering the use of wood cladding and, and the implications of that. Um, homes that do have significant amount of wood cladding on the outside can have, uh, m can be much more susceptible to fire. And so in discussion with some other municipalities, in particular in discussion with planning staff in Kelowna, I did ask if they had received pushback on requirement for non-combustible cladding because of the impacts um, to aesthetics and you know, the desire that some people may have to use wood. Um, and they actually said that in their community in Kelowna, there's a fairly broad acceptance of these types of guidelines. 
Um, they've seen examples of fires running into neighborhoods and clear evidence of homes with combustible exteriors burning down while adjacent homes with non-combustible exteriors are spared. And so they they don't have a problem with people uh, questioning the, the utility of those guidelines. And then if we're talking about embodied carbon, there is another question with, worth considering, which is what would the carbon footprint be to replace an entire home that had a combustible exterior and was lost in the interface fire plus loss of all the contents. So um, I think there, there's, there's a good balance here, um, even considering uh, embodied carbon. And then with landscaping, there are additional trade-offs. Conifers are considered aesthetically very desirable for privacy and year-round greenery, but they are fire-prone and a significant potential hazard. And so significant work was done in the creation of the landscape regulations to find a balance between allowing some conifers, but minimizing the risks that they pose. I'm now gonna pass the presentation to Asia to discuss the phasing of the DPA. Thanks, Matt. So when staff reviewed the full wildfire DPA internally with our planning and building staff, we realized that this would have a substantial impact on staff workloads on a similar scale to the implementation of the recently adopted flood hazard regulations. So to address this impact, we're proposing taking a phased approach and are recommending that the DPA be broken into two phases. So phase one would apply a significantly reduced set of guidelines, basically focusing on roofing material for multifamily and industrial and commercial developments. Fire resistant roofing is the most critical building related element that can protect development against wildfire hazard. So it's the single best thing that we can do to protect our structures. Phase one also focuses on new subdivisions with a set of guidelines to guide lot layout, access roads and water servicing. The subdivision section also employs covenant registration to ensure ongoing conformance to the wildfire EPA guidelines as new homes and buildings are constructed on the newly created lots. Phase two applies the full set of guidelines as well as a comprehensive application of wildfire covenant registration. So along with the fire resistant roofing, phase two includes the other fire resistant building components, including cladding and windows and decks, as well as covering detailed landscaping guidelines. So to address staff resourcing, we also need to plan to accommodate this additional layer of administration within our development related departments. Currently, there's no capacity to implement even this first phase of the development permit area. So we're recommending that phase one implementation be aligned with the addition of a 1.0 FTE resource to the building department. And then once phase one has been absorbed, we can then do further analysis to determine what the phase two resourcing requirements would be. I also want to point out that this uh, 1.0 FTE resource would also help administer the flood hazard regulations, step code, green energy density bonusing program, and the demolition recycling programs that are coming down the line. So the table is shown here and included in the staff report summarizing the phasing structure for the secondary and primary hazard areas. I'll take a moment to highlight just a few aspects of the phasing and the differences between the various types of development in the secondary and primary areas. So firstly, all subdivisions in the secondary hazard areas are exempt from the wildfire DPA if covenants are registered on all lots. And then in the primary hazard area only, small lot subdivisions are also exempt, but larger lot subdivisions will be required to go through the DP process. The subdivision processes are the same across the phases and there's no change when we move from phase one to phase two. And then moving along the table for phase one, small scale developments, including single family and duplexes, these are exempt from the DP process if fire resistant roofing is used. And when we move to phase two, small scale development is still exempt, but now only if a covenant is registered on the property as opposed to being exempt without a covenant in phase one. And then lastly, for phase uh, one, for larger scale developments, so these include multifamily, commercial and industrial, in both the primary and the secondary hazard areas, 
these are required to go through the DP process, but only the fire resistant roofing guideline is applied in phase one. And then in phase two, fire resistant roofing plus landscaping guidelines apply in the secondary hazard area, while fire resistant roofing plus other fire resistant building components plus the landscaping guidelines are applied in the primary wildfire hazard area. So overall, the DPA has been drafted to primarily capture multifamily, commercial, industrial, and larger subdivision developments and exempt the smaller mom and pop developments. So as outlined in the previous table, the DPA provides exemption options for single family and we're trying to balance the amount of additional regulations that are being added to our land development processes in the district. But when we look at the landscape guidelines specifically, we see that they are important in our overall fire smart um, best practices and they're a critical component to address across every type of development, not just those large multifamily or mixed use developments. We also see that there's a significant amount of landscaping in Squamish's single family neighborhoods that does not meet the fire smart guidelines and has an increased wildfire hazard risk in these areas. So to avoid the additional burden of doing development permits or enforcing covenants for single family, staff are proposing that as part of phase two, uh, that a wildfire landscaping management bylaw be drafted to regulate landscaping on private properties. And this landscaping bylaw would need to be combined also with an educational program in order for us to achieve a high level of uptake and success in the program. The regulations in the landscaping bylaw would include uh, some key fire smart landscaping practices, such as avoiding planting cedar, yew, and juniper hedging, spacing out coniferous trees away from buildings, as well as from other coniferous trees. Uh, given the popularity of cedar hedging in residential areas, we know this bylaw is likely to generate significant community concerns, but these are the trade-offs that Matt touched on earlier and that can be made to further reduce the fire hazard risks in our neighborhood. The public engagement for the project included two virtual open houses, two surveys, we did targeted feedback uh, soliciting from the local development and building industry at two stages in the development of the bylaw. We met with the development liaison committee of the Urban Development Institute. Uh, we also brought the bylaw to the advisory design panel for feedback and referred the bylaw to Squamish Nation. So staff are recommending that council provide feedback on three targeted areas, resourcing and the delayed implementation of phase one of the wildfire DPA, the overall phasing approach, and specifically anything related to the DPA guidelines themselves. And we also are recommending that council direct staff to bring forward the wildfire DPA and associated bylaw amendments for consideration of formal readings. And that concludes Matt and I's presentation. I'll Actually, stop sharing my screen here. AJ, I'm just going to add one thing. I, there was a mistake there that I had made. It was one survey and I changed it to apologies. It, we did one survey in the engagement. That was my mistake. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council, questions? Mayor Elliott, Councilor Anderson, Councilor French. Thank you. Um, did we or could we? I'm wondering if there's an alternate way to do this rather than introducing a whole new DP area. And so could we not for the first phase just require it in zones that you have fire resistant roofs? Um, or alternatively, can it be combined with um, our form and character DPs to address these things so that it's one? Part of one process that already exists rather than a separate. Mr. Gunn. Um, so, one of the challenges uh, is in, in this particular field is that we aren't allowed to have higher requirements 
than the BC building code, except in some very specific specific situations. And the the use of a DP, which is intended to address a hazard, is one of those situations where we're able to do that. We aren't able to create a zoning regulation to achieve that. We need this. There, our authority to do so comes through the DP process. Um, but uh, as a follow up to um, streamlining, uh, the if someone is applying for a DP, for example, a multifamily or um, industrial commercial project, uh, when they apply for the form and character DP that they would be normally applying for, this can be an added um, set of guidelines that get added to it. It doesn't end up being two separate DPs, so they, they make a DP application that includes both components. So, But we're not really requiring more than the building code. We're just saying that you have to use uh, either materials A or B. Uh, through, through you, um, Councillor Race, uh, I, I believe that does constitute a requirement of, of beyond the um, the building code because it is specifying a particular um, product or or. A Category of product that is not a specific recommend or requirement of the building code. For example, you could use wood shakes and still meet the building code requirements. And we are saying you have to do something else, and that is therefore beyond the requirements of the building code. Thus, meaning that we need to rely on the DP authority to to do this. Right. So, th thanks for that clarity. And then we have the universal guidelines DP area, and and so some of it applies to. Um, specific DPs, but not others. So, um, so we're not adding this into DP area three. It has to sit alone. Through you, Councillor Race. Great question. We did go through a bit of this thought process. What we could do is we can um, each of our DPs has specific um, rationale or objectives they're trying to achieve, and you need to include what you're trying to achieve. And we could, into the universal guidelines, add the additional um, objective of achieving wild, uh, sorry, fire smite or uh, you know wildfire interface wildfire hazard um, issues, uh, and and then we could put the um, the roofing element into the universal guidelines. But form and character DPAs, which the universal DPA is, applies only to um, certain categories of construction, and they don't apply to single family. So if we want to get single family, we have to move away from the form of character and create this hazard DPA exclusively, and then we can apply that to all types of construction, including the, the single family. And through the chair, just one other quick thing to add is it also allows us to apply it to subdivision, which isn't triggered through the form and character DPA. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Anderson, Councillor French, Councillor Pettingill. Thank you. I have a few questions. I'll start with the matter of exterior cladding in phase two as proposed. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Gunn's discussion of trade offs with respect to wood and cladding, use of wood. Um, I, I have to begin by highlighting, and I have to, two, two related questions, but that we are a wood first community under the Canadian Wood Council, and we're the first wood first community in Canada, and the Canadian Wood Council and the National Building Code do have a lot to say about fire retardant wood cladding products and guidelines and advice and so forth. My question or suggestion is regarding the language uh, in uh, with respect to the cladding, and um, I'm going to refer to North Vancouver. You have highlighted the example of Kelowna, However, North Vancouver should be of interest to Squamish with very uh, similar um, attributes as regards uh, wildfire hazards. And the North Vancouver uh, DPA guidelines use the language of fire resistant materials. They do not specify any further than that. And so my suggestion is that perhaps instead of listing uh, products, which uh, the, the list is but not restricted to, which means it would might come in there, might not, but it is a business center, and we do have products that uh, are manufactured here locally. We have three firms specializing in wood cladding. One produces fire retardant wood uh, products by a variety of means. Another produces thermally modified wood cladding. 
And so can we uh, consider an adjustment to the language to remove li the list of pro products um, and adopt the North Vancouver approach, which leaves it open and just simply fire resistant materials. And uh, we have plenty of precedents for that outside of North Vancouver, including in the National Building Code. Um, I have a follow up on that, but I'll just leave it at that for now, Mr. Gunn. Um, yeah, and Asia, if you want to jump on on this uh, too, but my, my, oh, sorry, through the chair. Um, my uh, initial um, response is that, um, you know, the, that's certainly a change that we can consider. Um, the, the language was specifically crafted to not be um, product specific, but to, because it's not focused on use these products, but it's focused on fire resistant, it could include um, fire resistant wood products. Um, sometimes having some specifics in there does help uh, provide clarity in discussions with developers, but as you say, that also may guide them in a particular direction. So, um, you know, I think that there's openness uh, to removing those components and maybe I'll uh, pass to my colleague to see if uh, Asia has any thoughts on that. Uh, through the chair, I would agree with what you're saying, Matt, and I would just invite Bruce Blackwell, who was heavily involved in the development of the North Vancouver DPA. So I'm not sure if he has any uh, particular thoughts, but it, it appears to be working well in North Van, and so that I definitely think that's something we could consider rephrasing the language. Go ahead, Mr. Blackwell. Yeah, through the chair. Um, this is a, I, I agree with um, Councillor Anderson's um, approach. I think it should, it, fire resistant is appropriate. Um, the, on, the only thing I'll just tell you that there are a number of wood products out there that are not rated that builders and developers come and say, this is sold as fire resistant. And unless it meets some very rigorous tests um, and or it's CSA approved, in North Van, they haven't accepted it. So um, my caution is this does open up an interpretation issue that may end up um, causing some staff issues around time and sensitivity around trying to establish whether something is in fact rated and is in fact approved as a CS CSA standard. So that would be my only concern coming out of North Van, but uh, uh, Councillor is correct. It has worked relatively effectively in, with the exception of some circumstances where builders have insisted on using products that aren't, aren't truly rated. Thank you, Mr. Blackwell. Um, and I do agree that there is some, uh, um, or, uh, there is some orient orientation issues. And this leads me to my second question or, or uh, suggestion. You have authored, Mr. Blackwell, uh, a fire smart landscaping guide, which is included in the uh, package before us. I wonder whether there is some potential to include, and I believe this may be of some importance, some general importance, um, some uh, guiding orientation on cladding products. And in fact, there are likely some examples out there, uh, at least specifically addressing wood products. Of course, this is changing over time and no doubt landscaping, the landscaping world is always evolving as well. So that suggestion then uh, as to an additional uh, guide uh, orientation kit to accompany along the lines of the FireSmart landscaping package. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Uh, Councillor French, then Councillor Pettengill. Well, Thanks, Chair. Um, so, in reading through the staff report and then uh, this presentation this afternoon, uh, I think I'm 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 hearing that this is not necessarily going to slow down um, the development application process, but I'm wondering if staff could sort of package that issue and just tell us how um, staff is going to ensure that this doesn't slow down an, an already slow process and a, a process that we're, we're taking some heat over. No pun intended. I can speak to that. Uh, thank you, Fruit Chair. So that, that is why we're proposing to phase uh, the implementation because it will slow down the process if we don't add more resources. Um, 
we are uh, already dealing with a big backlog of uh, building permit applications. Um, so phase one would certainly have an effect. Um, and what we're looking at for next year is uh, proposing a solution to deal with the increased volume of applications. And alongside to implement this, we will need also uh, kind of as a separate resource um, from just you know, getting back to our usual times, uh, we will need additional building resources uh, to deal with the plan checking that has to happen before the application gets to a building inspector or a plan reviewer to uh, to start the review. Because right now we don't even look at things like roofing materials or what kind of materials are using are being used for for siding. Uh, those are not the things that we check for. So, um, you know, these are going to be additional tasks um, and we're this year, uh, you know, this year we had a 50% increase in building permit applications from last year. So we need to deal with that issue uh, alongside this additional regulation. Okay, um, thank you for that. And so then that leads me to my, my next thought around timing and budgeting. Um, are we looking at uh, the 2022 budget year um, for that one FTE that we heard about? Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing nodding, yes. <laughs> and uh, my, my final question on this is uh, around fees. I didn't see any indication that this will lead to additional fees. Um, is that the situation or will there be additional fees to accommodate this uh, new initiative? Uh, through you, uh, Chair. So there will be uh, additional fees for development permits um, when a when a development permit gets triggered in phase one. Uh, there would be, but that would be only applicable to multifamily um, kind of commercial industrial uh, base buildings. Um, there would be at this point no fees at the building permit stage uh, for that additional work because it's all wrapped into the same building permit. We are looking at. Uh, revising the fees this year uh, for building permit applications. Um, so that should, um, you know, that is a, a, a reflection of this added regulation that our building department has to deal with. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Pettengill, myself, and then Councilor Herford, now Councilor Stoner. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, so a couple of questions. The one there's a, a number of references to covenants. It's not clear to me what these covenants say. Is is it that you know I assume all liability if there's a fire for my property and my neighbors, or or what what are we putting in these covenants, or to the degree we would use them? You muted. Thank you. Apologies. So through the chair, we've been working on a draft covenant template we haven't got too down far down the road it would likely have an indemnification clause that's quite a standard one um, very similar to our flood hazard covenants that we use but in terms of the content um, specific to wildfire hazard protection the covenant would focus solely on the building materials the roofing the cladding and the other components, but not on the landscaping um, because that's proposed to be pulled into the separate landscaping uh, management bylaw. And so, Chair, if I can just clarify, so does that mean then if we have these covenants in place, it would be sort of a, my agreement that if I didn't use what I said I was going to use after the fact, the municipality would have more ability to take action on that or or it is that the idea here? Correct. Yeah, through the chair, that would be the district enforcing on on that covenant. And that would also uh, tie into the resourcing that's required. So if we do want to follow through on the covenants, that requires additional uh, resourcing. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and so somewhat related to this and, and some of the questions from my colleagues, I guess, and this may just speak to my misunderstanding of the process, but in my mind, you know, a lot of people are under DPA three. If you're not under that, you're probably most likely under at least one other DPA. 
and it seems those generally require some architectural diagrams. And when we see a variance permit, we get a list of, of all the sort of consolidated guidelines. Uh, some are more subjective, some are more objective and, and how they've met. And, you know, in my mind, this would just be another couple points, especially in phase one, a couple other items to hit. I guess so it's not clear to me why what we're talking about in phase one especially would be a huge addition to the process if you're already providing architectural diagrams and stuff for a different DPA. Through the chair, uh, I'll take a crack at this one. So the the additional resourcing also um, comes down to explaining the process and the back and forth that we have with the community and, and builders and developers trying to explain the regulations and um, some of that just it all takes additional time and add to, adds to the process. Um, but I, I would pass it along to Jonas to maybe speak to the existing backlog and how that really does tie in. You know, phase one is not a huge amount, but it's still um, an amount that's on top of something that we're still trying to work through. Yeah, uh, through you, Chair. It's really when, so the planning review is not a big issue. Excuse me. Uh, the planning review is not a, the big issue. It, the issue is when um, the application hits the building permit desk. So all those applications hit the building permit desk. And at that point, it's up to the plan reviewer to make sure that whatever was approved in DP um, gets translated on the building plans. And at this point, uh, you know, our, our plan reviewers don't even check the, those important materials, which is what is what are they using for siding and what are they using for roofing? And we do have already a deficit um, of, of, of uh, our plan checking resources that we need to deal with, which was, you know, every layer of regulation, especially things like floodplain, um, Floodplain management uh, adds significant requirements on the building department to make sure the they're following the covenants, make sure they're following the floodplain bylaw, the floodplain development permit area. So this is just an additional layer um, with which we can't deal with easily without impacting the the review timelines more. Okay, thank you. And one final just uh, follow up then, and with this sort of thing. Do we revalidate at occupancy uh, for an occupancy permit, or is that only apply to larger buildings and developments? Um, so we we would have to change our uh, occupancy process. Uh, right now, again, siding, roofing are not materials that we inspect. Uh, we don't plan review for them at, when they submit an application, and we don't inspect for it at the end of the process either. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I have myself, uh, Councillor Herbert, Councillor Stoner, Councillor Anderson for a second time, unless there's somebody else for a first time in the meantime. So, uh, Steph, I was just curious um, if this was in effect, what would happen with existing uh, building, uh, existing construction? So, for example, somebody in a single family home in the Highlands wanted to put a new roof on. Uh, or change the siding. I've seen several just resided lately, um, or even build another fence. Get rid of the cedar fence. Would they have to go to something non-flammable? Could they? Could they could go to a shape roof, or would they be forced at this time to change to steel or asphalt or something like that? Could they put on cedar siding again if they chose to, or would they have to go to something like a hardy board or whatever other non-flammable sides there are? How will that apply? Go ahead, Ms. Phil. Yeah, so through the chair for your single family example, for phase one, they would have to do a non combustible class A or class B roof only. They could do whatever cladding, fencing, or landscaping they want because that's not covered under phase one. And then under phase two, the single family would be exempt from having to do the development permit area if they register a covenant on title that says that they will do the non-combustible roof and the cladding and all the other building components. And then hopefully in tandem with phase two, we would also have that landscaping maintenance bylaw 
that would speak to all of the landscaping aspects on the single family homes. Thank you, uh, Councilor Herford. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add my voice to the, um, the material discussion. I see value in having something that's a policy that's technology and or material agnostic. And I think Mr. Blackwell's point of the, the definition needs to be flushed out as to what would be considered non combustible. Um, but I see value in that. In, and as, as this uh, EPA is sort of being used over over time as technology changes, I think the goal is 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 important rather than materials be associated with that goal. So I'd be supportive of, of uh, some work uh, on the language in that particular um, area to avoid the pitfalls that uh, Mr. Blackwell uh, outlined um, from uh, from Vancouver. And um, so that's that that bit. But then the covenant. Part does this stay with this continues with the next property owner in this in this context? That just stays. That's a covenant applied to the property. And it stays over time. Okay. I guess there's not. That was the one question that was an easy answer with a nod, and the first bit was <laughs> uh, about just making sure we're achieving the goals. Thank you very much for your work, folks. Thank you, uh, Councilor Stoner, Councilor Anderson. Thank you. I guess I had a question, clarifying question about the landscaping management bylaw that's proposed to come in phase two. Um, but the table that staff provided also suggests that there would be landscaping guidelines for multifamily and ICI in phase two in the DP. I'm just curious why we take two different tracks there as opposed to just looping it into one or the other. Through the chair, I can take a stab and then Matt can go if he wants to add to this. So the, the rationale for the landscaping management bylaw is primarily that we'd like to regulate the landscaping on single family properties, um, which make up a significant amount of the area of our neighborhoods currently. And so the inclusion in the DPA is related to the, we apply that to multifamily and industrial and commercial. So we're kind of covering all our bases, all our different development types across the community by having both the DPA uh, phase two landscaping as well as this separate landscaping bylaw. Yeah, I, and I'll just add to that. The so so the multifamily, institutional, commercial, industrial, they're all going to go through a DPA process where they're going to submit a landscape plan. So we want to include those guidelines in that planning process, right? We don't want them to have one set of guidelines, landscaping guidelines, and then have somewhere else in a bylaw these elements that they need to meet from landscaping process. We want it all synchronized. So. That's why we have the wildfire DPA that applies to them. We considered that would we want to apply that to the entire community, but we don't want single family to go through a DP process when they want to go plant some hedges. Um, and uh, so, so we we're trying to find the method and there are actually 2 options that were considered. Another would be to over time, try and get covenants onto all the properties so that they have to comply with a covenant. But there's a bunch of administrative uh, reasons that that isn't um, a preferred option. And so what the, the, the resulting approach is that we adopt a bylaw, which granted is as an approach is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat um, ambitious plan to, to create a bylaw that has broad regulations around how single family uh, manage the landscape in, the, in their yards. For example, saying you can't do cedar you or uh, what's the third one? Uh, anyway, the th uh, part, which one? Juniper. Juniper, yeah, the three. Those are the worst defenders are, are you know, Bruce identified. These are like little bombs in your backyard. Um, and this is going to be a big deal because if you walk around these neighborhoods, they are everywhere. They're used extensively in, in our um, in our townhouses to create privacy. The people love them privacy around um, the single family neighborhoods. But these are high hazard elements to add to backyards. And so um, our goal is to use a bylaw, but then 
combine it with education. We, we think the education is really going to be the key to this. Um, and, you know, we're hoping that this approach over time could bring people online with um, with making these changes. But um, it is it is quite a big task to think about how to shift this behavior. And so what we're proposing is what we think is the best way to try to achieve it. Go ahead, Constance, tell me. And just a quick follow up there, if I'm correct in that we have kind of started a level of that education through the community fire smart grants, correct? Like we are doing regular tree trimmings and chipping uh, days in neighborhoods and, and trying to get that message out around what is fire smart planting. Um, like that education isn't necessarily super robust, but it is something that we are doing actively at this time. Yeah, correct. Through the chair, there there has been bits and bobs that we've been doing consistently, and and you know the the fire department uh, or emergency planning isn't here, and they could speak a lot better to that. But I, we know that there is some ongoing education that is continuing and. We would just like to build on that, particularly if this landscaping maintenance by law is enacted, then there'd be a, a larger rollout, but potentially similar to how we rolled out the single use plastics approach and, and kind of having a, a lot of information available to the community around that. Finish Councilor Center. So I had said Councillor Anderson, um, but Mayor Elliott has not spoken yet. And then for second go around, I have Councillor Anderson and Councillor Pettengill. Clearly I wasn't very memorable the first time around, but I have already spoken. Well, have you? <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm happy for you to just put me on the list. I'll follow whoever. Okay, well then we have Councillor Anderson, another memorable speaking from Mayor Elliott, and then Councillor Pettengill. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to ask about the uh, provision for 10 meter setbacks and I'll just quote from the text under the subdivision section. The 10 meter fire priority zone 1 areas around future building sites should aim to be situated outside of streamside protection and enhancement areas where possible. Uh, my question is, um, uh, well, it is a question that's been raised by 1 of our correspondents in the public input section and that person pointed to pinch drive. And during our uh, processing of the Finch Drive uh, sub area plan, we did indeed conclude, or at least I did, that there are going to be some hardship cases there. And at least at 1014 uh, Finch, and there's probably four other properties on Finch and Raven that are seriously impacted by the conservation zone. And so there is some wording language in that uh, sub area plan, but my question to you is, uh, should this be tested? Uh, how this is going to work for those property owners. And really the question is, can we insert or interpret a hardship clause for those property owners? They, there are certainly some that will be seriously impacted by uh, implement, full implementation of this. Through the chair. Yeah. So that's a fantastic question, Councillor Anderson. Um, we followed up with one of the individuals who we have been corresponding with. Um, and we did some testing uh, for the Chikai development specifically um, in terms of uh, buffering against some of the trails and forested areas that they're wanting to preserve. That same individual pointed out that Finch in particular would be another one to test. Staff haven't completed that exercise, but we are intending to complete that. And during that discussion with the individual uh, we actually discussed potentially re or tweaking the wording of that particular guideline to uh, bet better align with kind of how how we're managing um, some of the landscaping in the other guidelines, particularly you know having um, the guideline that says have a five meter setback from the building structure to to the coniferous tree trunk. And so perhaps considering reducing that 10 meter fire priority zone um, to maybe more specifically reference the 5 meter setback of trees from the building structure. So that's something that staff is, has taken to heart and will be working on before we bring this back again. Thank you, Ms. Philp. Uh, Chair, I do have an additional quick question, but I'm happy to step to the back of the line if you wish. Oh, go ahead. 
Very good, Dan. Um, in these, uh, uh, there is some language regarding, and I'm sorry, I don't have the section, but in, I believe there's two versions. One, uh, it states direct building sites towards lower angle slopes. An earlier version, uh, I believe Mr. Gunn might be, be able to advise on this, had locate, so there may be a wording change there. But my question is, uh, this may have implications, especially for new subdivisions on our slopes, uh, lot 509-510, Newport Ridge, University Heights, Clumpert Woods, all of which will be subject to sub area planning processes. My question is whether this, the implications of this for gardens, driveways, and other uses of flatter terrain on a building lot, whether the sub area planning process may be a better opportunity to properly review the scenarios for lot development of this provision to direct to direct buildings um, to flat ground. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Gunn. Yeah, so um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so that in that uh, meeting we had with uh, one of the stakeholders uh, that Asia just referenced, we also discussed this this uh, area. And the you're right that there are two versions of the uh, DPA guidelines. The one that is on the agenda was actually modified based on that conversation to create a little bit additional flexibility. Um, and there were there were a couple spots where where we added that flexibility in. Um, the DPA is a set of guidelines. They aren't regulatory as a zoning bylaw is. So there is the ability to use discretion in the application of the guidelines to suit the particular context. Um, and so we created a bit of additional um, uh, flexibility in those specific guidelines related to subdivision and siting uh, in relation to flat ground and adjacency to, um, to uh, um, gully features and and the likes to to try and recognize that there are going to be some situations where we're going to have to use discretion, but um, maybe uh, just before leaving this topic, and so so we I think that by creating that flexibility, we have the opportunity to accommodate um, some site design and uh, in in steeper terrain. But uh, yeah, so just before leaving this conversation, I might ask uh, our consultant Bruce to just speak for just a second about why it's important to to um, uh, site uh, on steep slopes in particular fashions. Go ahead, Mr. Blackwell. Yeah, there's two parts to fire smart um, that are very important, but slopes carry fire more quickly, always uphill from the bottom of the slope to the top of the slope. And what happens is the fuels preheat faster, they ignite faster, and they're diff more difficult to control on a slope. The 10 meter setback uh, is based on science. In other words, uh, a forest fire creates uh, a certain amount of radiant heat, and it takes 10 meters for that radiant heat to dissipate before it doesn't have the capacity to start a flammable substance on fire. So the priority one zone is very important in that it's limiting direct flame front from generating enough heat to actually ignite something flammable around the structure or the structure itself. So I hope that makes it clear. So just on that point, Mr. Blackwell, so is it possible if there was a hardship situation to relax that 10 meter to say five meter, for example, uh, if you applied some particular cladding to the building um, or fireproofing to the building? I mean, ultimately, it's a question of risk to the community. If you had um, some relaxation in limited circumstances, I, I wouldn't see it as, as a risk, a huge risk contributing factor, but certainly you, want, you wouldn't want to apply it broadly or along a whole face of homes. I don't know how many people saw in, uh, a lake country a few years ago, there was a fire started on Okanagan Lake and it ran up to a series of, of homes that were on a flat bench about 200 meters off the lake. The fire ran up the slope, started one building on fire and then carried to multiple buildings. And, and there was significant evacuation issues related to that fire. And there were many homes that were lost in that fire and it all occurred within less than, less than three or four hours. 
So slopes on their own contribute some generally difficult fire behavior. And then relaxing multiple homes in this circumstance makes them vulnerable to multiple ignition. So it, it, in my mind, we'd have to be pretty careful about how many uh, circumstances you allow this to creep into. Thank you. Uh, to Mayor Elliott and Council Pamela second. Thank you. I remember in our conversation uh, last winter when we first took a look at this and and Council was sort of opening to sort of dialing up um, our requirements to encompass more of the community and making sure that we were applying sort of a really strong lens of resilience on this DP area guideline. So I'm just curious, given the wildfire seasons that we've seen in recent times, where we sit in comparison to other communities uh, in terms of what you're proposing here and what's already in place um, in the interior or the North Shore. Um, and that actually might be helpful for our public when we bring this back for readings is just to situate it in the context of the province, because I think ideas around resiliency are changing, but I don't have a concept yet about like, are we, you know, providing the most level of restriction or are we somewhere near the, the bottom in terms of more, a more relaxed approach? John, go ahead. Through the chair, I, I feel that this question would maybe be best answered by uh, Bruce, um, who has more familiarity having worked on uh, a range of DPs through the province. Bruce, can I hand it to you? Thanks. Um, Mayor Elliott, you, you directed us a year ago to write um, uh, a DPA that was strong and a DPA that would protect Squamish. And I would suggest that DPAs in BC have evolved. And at this time, this would be one of the strongest DPAs because it tackles one of the most difficult issues, which is landscaping. I think the, the building material issue is well covered off in most DPAs, but where DPA enforcement has kind of broken down is on landscaping. And I, I've written guidance to Kelowna twice because the guidance wasn't working and they've adopted a more stringent DPA, but this one now I think is, I, I honestly believe this has some very good elements to it and would, would be what I would recommend as, as a model. Um, that being said, um, it is more stringent um, with, with some very good measures on making sure that that landscaping standard is, is held to account. And that, that to me is really important in terms of thinking about an ember shower and thinking about uh, fire spreading property to property, uh, or the, it, you're not gonna get a structure to structure fire now because you've really hardened off the building structure with these guidelines, but where you're open if you don't deal with landscaping is property to property from the landscape propagation, either through the things that are being mitigated, cedar, juniper and yew, um, that, generally are linear features on properties that propagate fire between homes. So I, I think that's how I would sum it up. Um, and I, I have to say, I give a similar presentation to the regional district of Okanagan, so Milk and they're not set up like a municipality, but they've decided that it's that any DPA, the DPAs in general there have become so onerous that they don't want to try and apply them at a regional district level. So you, we, I've seen councils and regional districts take all kinds of stances on this. And, uh, but I think th this is a, a strong DPA. Thanks for that insight, uh, Bruce. I really appreciate it. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Pendergill, then I'll put myself back in this. Yeah, thank you. And I, I may have sort of heard the answer to my question, but just to make sure I'm gonna ask, and, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around why we would need covenants and and i gather it's because this would be a dpa which is just a guideline and the covenants then give us the the legal authority to pursue this but i guess what i'm wondering is we would you know proceed to development permit and so on based on our opinion the person had met the guidelines and they would make a commitment to those guidelines in my mind through the dp process and if we subsequently found they hadn't 
I would assume we would have the leverage to deal with it. And I guess where I'm going is, is there a way we could have a very similar level of authority and sort of assurance without adding on covenants or our covenants or the sort of extra layer of complexity really necessary? Like how much extra benefit are we getting in terms of solving the problem for using covenants here? Through the chair, I'll start. Um, so we're using the covenants in a, in a bunch of different ways. Specifically for subdivision, we want to apply the covenant so that when those new lots have new homes being built on them, that the new homes are following the building roofing and, and cladding guidelines and that they don't have to go through the development permit process. So that's one aspect where the covenant, I think, is, is an appropriate tool to apply. So for subdivision and then for exempting single family development, um, the, the covenant tool allows us to ensure that any future renovations and, and the ongoing maintenance of that house, that they're meeting, meeting the guidelines over the length of the, the home or the building. Um, so, so that's another rationale for using, for using and applying that covenant tool. Um, I'm not sure if Matt or Jonas wants to add to that. Um, I'm just going to going to follow up, oh, sorry, through the chair, I'll follow up on uh, what Asia said, which uh, is that, um, I guess to put a point on it, the the covenant process is used in, in a number of jurisdictions as a way to circumvent the more onerous process of going through a DP application. Um, by getting a covenant on title, we then have something we can say in the building permit process, let's just check to make sure it works. The DP is much more involved, um, and so if we can get people into the covenant process, we remove some of the burden on them. It does place a burden on the district to manage, thus we are asking for the additional resources to have somebody to check to make sure that people are complying with the covenants. But it does reduce one of the steps that someone who's a, going through the process of you know, building a new home has to go through. If, if the covenant gets established at subdivision stage, it lands on their property, then the homeowner comes in built. They if they can choose to just comply with a covenant versus making an application for a DP and going through that process, it's an easier, smoother process for them. Uh, and so that's that's kind of a real, a real key um, reason that we want to use those. And in fact, in other communities, for example, in the regional district of East Kootenai, their whole wildfire DP process is set up with the intention of getting people to register the covenant and never do a DP. They just want to get those covenants on title, have people comply with those and not worry about the DP. The problem is that the enforcement of the covenants can become quite challenging, in particular around the landscaping. Uh, and that's why we, while we originally thought about trying to do the landscaping uh, broadly through covenant process, um, we felt that the, the chance that that would be effective was much lower than if we went through the bylaw process. Thank you. Um, which actually is a segue into my point, which is similar to that, and that is um, it's one thing to have a covenant, but basically a covenant is a promise. Uh, and the question is what happens if you break the promise or a future landowner breaks a promise? Because covenants run with the land typically, and as Councillor Herbert commented on earlier, so would apply to the next purchaser and the one after that and one after that and so forth indefinitely as long as the covenant's in force. Uh, but enforcing a covenant, um, I think, is basically only by Supreme Court injunction. Uh, and that's not a simple process. And so I can understand local governments not wanting to get too enthusiastic about enforcing a whole bunch of covenants because that's quite a significant thing. It's much like the position we were in with uh, with Airbnbs, you know, the zoning bylaw creates a regime and somebody breaks it, we have to enforce it through, um, through a Supreme Court injunction. So I think what we'd like, to, I'd like to see considered at least, and I really don't know the answer to this, and we probably have to talk, talk to uh, legal counsel about it, is having a system where we can have both of them. Um, because I think there's some advantage to having the ability of a bylaw, bylaw officer going to a property, noting an infraction and being able to issue a fine. 
Uh, it's quite summary. It happens quite quickly. There's an instant penalty. Um, and so you don't have all the legal infrastructure that's involved with enforcing the covenant. So I would just suggest that we look at that um, as some way of enforcing it. Uh, and, and I'm thinking of something like, you know, like our fire smart or bear smart um, covenants, for example, can't have an apple tree with apples on it, et cetera, and, and, uh, or apples on the ground, you know, otherwise there's a fine. So, so some regime like that, uh, when we're talking things like landscaping and what happens if somebody goes and sides one of the walls with, uh, with something that's fire, it's not fire resistant. Uh, so I'll leave you with that thought. Uh, Mr. Gunn? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a really good point. And, and I, our hope is that with the proposal we have, by covering landscaping broadly across the community in the bylaw, we can always tackle that through the bylaw process with the building elements um, because uh, a building permit will be involved in, in new construction. Um, the, the DP element and the covenant can both be caught in, in the building um, process for, for much of the, the potential applications. Okay, uh, Councillor Herbert. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about um, as we start working with this uh, DPA, um, if we see any um, need to build in the ability to uh, change it over time and whether that affects our um, use of covenants in a particular spot, um, just where a bylaw is, is, um, is, is um, enforceable from the uh, Whenever the changes, whenever the changes happen, I'm just wondering about those covenants that are essentially a snapshot in time of the regulation that would stay with the, the property on an ongoing basis. Um, and is that a concern at all? Is there do we see a need to revisit the um, wildfire EPA in five years? What's the what's the shelf life? I guess five years, ten years. Are we going to change there? Um, any any thoughts on? On, on that, and particularly in relation to the covenant, I think is where I'm is where my mind is going. Yeah, I'll try to I'll try to break it down. So, in in terms of the shelf life, I think this is where it becomes important for us to monitor and to try to keep some sort of tab on whether we're affecting. Like, you know, is the DPA effective? Or not, and if it's not, then that's when we would go back to review things. And you know, we we do have in our future work plans to review the DPAs in general. Um, so this would likely be be part of that inclusion um, in that review. Um, specifically, in terms of the covenant, you're you're correct. It is a snapshot, but. If the covenant speaks to non combustible roofing material and cladding, you know, that that practice is not likely to shift dramatically over time. If there's changes in technology uh, and wood technology that in, increase the number of products that are non combustible, and if those are tested and rated, then we would accept those. And that the covenant wouldn't um, eliminate or or reference those because it would be worded broadly enough to uh, to allow those materials. So I I personally don't see an issue kind of with the covenants um, getting outdated rapidly. Mr. Belanishkas. Um, thank you, Chair. I was just going to add that this is very similar, probably to our flood uh, plain management, and we do a lot of that through covenants as well. Um, and we've been doing that for uh, probably 15, 20 years now, you know, and so every time there's um, kind of a new development that comes along on the same property, it, it, a lot of properties already have a flood covenant. That new development triggers a new building permit. And at that point, we look at the, what's, uh, you know, what year the, the current covenant is on the property and replace it with a new covenant when there's new development coming on. Mr. Gunn. Yeah, and I think last thing, it's, it is a good point in terms of that snapshot in time. And, and I think what we could do uh, following this meeting is go through all of the guidelines because it's the, essentially the guidelines in the DPA that form the, the content of the um, covenant. 
So we can go through that carefully and look at it with an eye towards kind of the timeless aspect and try and make sure that there's nothing in there that is going to be superseded by changes in technology or products. And, and um, I, I, if there are, we could, we could look at tuning those um, to try and increase the timelessness of the, the regulations. Thank you. Cool. Something happened. I think you lost the power. Oh, okay. I should be able to last. So, uh, any further comments or questions from Council? So, trying to wrap this up, one of the goals, Councillor Anderson, did you have? Yes, I did, Chair, and I was going to wait until after the uh, resolution was uh, was put forward, but I'll, I'll raise it now if you wish. Um, I'm pleased to see that uh, the planning department has referred one of our correspond uh, pieces of correspondence to the solid waste and sustainability coordinator. And it, this concerns uh, handling of woody debris from maintaining uh, landscaping and, and yards and properties. And I, I just wanted to highlight that because this is an issue that we should give attention to in this whole um, world of what we're talking about. We, at the present time, have reduced yard waste pickup during the peak late fall and early spring periods for landscaping in most people's properties. And uh, this means that we have dumping, and it is an issue for several reasons, but not least for fire hazard issues. And we have uh, perhaps a disincentive to do landscaping maintenance uh, on properties. So that uh, the point I'm making is that uh, what we're talking about here is part of a bigger picture that does involve our solid waste department and um, the sustainability coordinator's involvement in issues around treat what we do with woody biomass uh, waste. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the goals is to provide feedback and I just want to see if we can quickly summarize this. Um, we had feedback on the definition of fire resistant materials. Um, Councilor Herbert? Yeah, and nothing prescriptive. There's how we got this definition rather than the describing the materials. Right. Uh, yeah, I think the general comments were to perhaps broaden it. So as long as it was fire resistant, it would take a broader range of materials. Council French? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just on that point, I think um, that it's important that with whatever we end up with, there should be a specific reference to Canadian Standards Association um, and specific to um, combustibility, with, yeah. like within the wording. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that was the advice we got as well. Um, so is there anybody uh, that is opposed to that being one of the points of feedback? No? Okay. Um, secondly, staff requested feedback on the 1FTE. Anybody have thoughts about that? Personally, I'll make a comment. Um, the, I would support this. Uh, there is certainly going to be a cost to this um, in this program. Uh, and I think this is from my perception. Uh, one of the um, I guess one of the costs of climate change, uh, and, and we have to be prepared for it, and we have to pay that cost. I think it's a simple answer. And so it is a budget process. Uh, we're not waiting for some future event. These dangers are already here. Um, so I'm prepared to support that particular uh, proposal of staff. Any other comments on that particular point? Anybody opposed to that? Okay. Feedback on that point. Um, Ms. Bill from Mr. Gunn, could you, I don't have it in front of me. Um, I don't want to lose my screen with the people on it. Uh, can you tell me what the other two points of feedback were that you were after? Yeah, through the chair. So it was just generally the phasing approach. So breaking into phase one and two. And then the third point was just on the DPA guidelines themselves. Okay, so let's deal with the phasing. Uh, any comments? Council on that, Councilor Stoner and Mayor Elliott. Yeah, I'll say that I'm I'm generally supportive of the phasing, although it took me a few times to read through it and listen very carefully at your presentation around how it will work and what it means for the different development streams. And so 
Um, I'm just cognizant that I think it needs to come with some much clearer communication. Um, also heard a lot of different questions around the difference between covenants versus the DP guidelines, uh, which for larger developers and for folks who are in and out of planning day in and day out is kind of like the back of your hand. But for the rest of us and, and the general community, I think adding some language there around what the difference is and how those vary will be really helpful going forward. Um, and so those would be my only comments on the phasing. But I think, as you've explained it, it makes rational sense to me, um, but it just needs a little bit more public facing communication uh, to make it a little bit more digestible. Any other comments on this point? No? Mira, oh, big pardon, Mira, go ahead, go ahead. I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you, but now I can hear you, and I think you can hear me. Um, uh, I, I agree with Councillor Stoner's comments. Um, just trying to figure out a way we can clarify this when we bring it forward for readings or provide examples, like a few community-based examples of a single-family home that's new or a single-family home that is under renovation and what that looks like in phase one and phase two. Um, I think our development community understands better uh, what this means for them because they've been in conversation with you. I think the other thing to consider, and it's not really related to um, my support of the phasing approach for this deep area guideline, it's just that I think education that's related to phase two needs to start in phase one. And I think most people want to do the right thing. And if you know that your house isn't safe, but you're about to do, you know, redo your landscaping or, or renovate your home, I think people will want access to the information sooner rather than later. Um, so whatever budget consideration we, we put around this for the one FTE, it would be great to launch some of that educational material sooner rather than later, even though the more stringent landscaping requirements aren't required until phase two. I just think a lot of people in our community will be paying attention to this and, and will wanna start to take steps to, to make improvements. And if they have the information at hand, it'll be much easier for them to do that. And I think that's the approach we're taking with our community climate action plan and trying to make it easy for people to understand how to replace um, you know, gas-fired heating with a heat pump and, and those sorts of things. So. That would be kind of my suggestion for the phased approach is to start the education right at phase one. Thank you. Councilor Herbert. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to support that that position. I think the I think we'll have a high level of voluntary compliance through through that process if we have the early education of uh, what the right thing to do is and the regulation that's coming uh, down the pipe at a, at a future date um, that has some guidance. So. I'm on board with that piece of it. Yeah, so am I. And, and I can remember speaking about this in uh, January of last year, uh, based on a personal experience I had with a fire inspection of, of my property, uh, which had almost comical outcomes actually, but um, I won't go into that. But once you know uh, what is bad and what is good, and Juniper's was the classic example of my house, my house my yard was littered with them. Um, if we're not going to be able to just go in and re-engineer all our neighborhoods overnight, but if people know what is good and what is not good, uh, a lot of that can happen uh, just by property owners. Uh, and so I, I agree. I think the education has to start right on day one uh, and get people going and, and particularly around relatively simple homeowner type things, which is landscaping, uh, as opposed to reconstructing a house or putting a new roof on. Uh, I think that's very important if we want to really try to try to get a grip on this. So, any other comments with respect to this particular point? No. Anybody opposed to this? Good. Uh, and the last one was. Um, I'm sorry. What was the last one again? Just go. The guidelines. Guidelines. Um, any comments on the guidelines? Did you have any particular feedback on the guidelines that you noted? Go ahead. I didn't make notes of any of the guidelines. 
Yeah, staff, staff have been keeping track of the conversation and, you know, like adjusting the language to speak to the non combustible cladding, cladding and broadening that you know, we, we have a bunch of points. So I don't think we need to go over those. It's been pretty clear through the conversation. Yeah, we covered that one off. Yeah. Were there any others that we, we mentioned? I don't recall any. I don't have a note of any. So, Councilor Anderson. I I don't want to introduce a new topic here, but the tree uh, management bylaw is referenced uh, in the DPA guidelines that, that are drafted and uh, perhaps is something that uh, uh, might, uh, I have been curious as to, now they are given precedence, the tree management by bylaw provisions and whether there are any scenarios, for example, uh, we can have trees, I have some in my neighborhood that are 80 centimeters in diameter that are probably fire risk. And so uh, just I'll just bring this up as to whether this may need, perhaps it already has had review as to how and why, uh, how is that going to work that the tree management bylaw takes precedence? And are there specific sections of that bylaw that uh, might be highlighted as introducing s scenarios for well, decision making in future. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, are there any other points of feedback that we missed, Council? Or staff, have you heard anything you want clarification on? No? Uh, with that, then, um, was there a motion? I should check my agenda. Oh, yes. Okay. That recommendation is that the District of Squamish receive the March 23rd, 2021 report on the draft wildfire development permit area and provide feedback on the following aspects. Resourcing and delayed implementation of phase one phasing approach DPA guidelines and its council direct staff to bring forward the wildlife development permit area official community plan and land development procedures bylaw amendments for consideration of formal hearings. So, anyway, moved by Councillor French, second by Councillor Anderson. Does anybody wish to speak to that? Councillor French, Councillor Pettenkrupp. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that um, th this is a big topic and it's complex. And I think we're very fortunate to have a strong consultant like Mr. Blackwell supporting our staff efforts. Um, some, once again, great work has been done um, by staff and uh, I support that work and the motion in front of us. Thank you. Pastor Patton, you're welcome. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll be supporting this. Appreciate the work. A um, few things I wanted to mention in the correspondence. I, I think there was some very legitimate concerns about the cost and complexity of all of this. Um, and, you know, as uh, my colleague spoke about these, unfortunately, are the realities of, of climate change. And uh, I'm glad to see that we are taking it seriously. It's um, so I was sort of reflecting how the pandemic has messed with a sense of time because, uh, you know, we have dealt with serious forest fires in our community uh, in, in the province and we've seen the devastating impacts. I, I think the pandemic, uh, for me anyways, is the detached me a bit from that and, and I had to sort of think about that um, and brought me back to how important this is. Um, it is a bit of a source of frustration when you know, see gas companies drive around saying, hey, use gas, it's cheaper. Um, and, and I think we see here, well, no, it's, it's not. It's, it's maybe what bill the, the costs show up on. Um, but I think this is why uh, I think a lot of the actions we're doing uh, are, are important. And, um, I, I didn't want to bring up the phasing when we spoke earlier, because I agree at the end of the day with the choice we've made, but I am conscious of the fact that the risk doesn't really care much about where we are in budgeting and staffing and so on. The risk is there regardless. And, and so I am mindful as we push stuff off into phase two, we're accepting that risk in the interim. And, and I have some discomfort with that, but I think our reality is um, this is a, a prudent plan for us. Uh, the final thing I'll, I'll want to mention, and coming back to the pandemic messing with my sense of time, sometime four pandemic times, uh, went to see a project at school district 48. So it was all the schools in the whole corridor and the kids from, I think, kindergarten up to grade 12 had uh, done projects around forest fires and fire safety and so on. 
And I learned so much from the kids about, you know, what you need to do, what you can do, their thoughts about what should be done. And it was an absolutely fantastic way to, I think, engage the whole community and, and learn about it. Um, and, and I think help kids come to terms with some of the scary things they hear about. And, and so just something to put in the back of our minds, uh, maybe in terms of education and so on. This is something to work with the school district on because they've uh, already done a bit of it. And um, so with that, I will uh, say thank you again to staff and, and I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Further comment? No, call a question. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Phil, Mr. Gunn, Bill Thank Nicholas. You. Um, there is nothing further on the agenda, so I'm looking for a motion to terminate. Moved by Councillor Stoner, second by Councillor Herbert. Sorry, you were out of my vision for a minute. <laughs> Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. See you tonight.